Thank you. So we are on item item nineteen. Uh, sorry, item. What page are we on? I've lost you. Oh, here it is. Waikato Innovation Group. Beg your pardon. Page 122 in our um, in your agendas. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman, um, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here. Uh, the purpose today is to just give you a quick update on the on our annual reports from Waikato Innovation and from Food Waikato. Um, I'm Barry Harris, for those of you that haven't met me before. Um, used to know my way around this chamber, but it's quite a few years ago now. Um, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed? <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. My uh, Chief Executive, uh, Stuart I'm Gordon, who you'll words. know well, uh, uh, will uh, give you a, a, a heads up on, the, on, I guess, the highlights of the past year. Um, all, I'll, all I'll say, um, uh, subject to questions later on, is it's been, it's been a, a, a great year, actually, for... Uh, for both organisations, and I say that, that in spite of um, some quite significant additional work associated with uh, restructuring ownership, which you'll be well aware of, um, but also our focus on the potential to develop a new dryer out at um, Innovation Park has is, is taken a lot of the, the team and the board's um, attention this year, but in spite of that, the, uh, the, the business has run well, um, both in terms of food Waikato, in terms of the, the, the production days and the, and, and the revenue that we've put through the organisation and the businesses that we've been growing, uh, particularly with a, a move and a focus more towards um, sheet milk products and stuff has been really exciting. So it continues the, the, the journey that we've been on for the last uh, six years. I guess it was a bit of a punt to start with and I think I've said to you before, but it has been, in my mind, very, very successful. Uh, a large amount of of uh, uh, export earning product put through the, the plant, um, but that's not the primary purpose of it. The purpose of it is to actually uh, give uh, companies the opportunity to, to develop up product and test it in market and, and get them past their teenage years and then send them out to, to do their own thing, and, and that's happening very successfully. Um, equally, in terms of the Waikato innovation side of the business, uh, very significant. Uh, involvement in economic development in the Waikato and, and, and very substantial Callaghan grants passed on through the organisation to Waikato companies. So um, from my perspective and the board's perspective, touch wood, um, uh, it's been a very successful and continuing to growing uh, uh, growth in this, in this uh, food innovation business. So can I hand over, Chairman, to Stuart? I'm not sure how much time we've got, so you know, shut us uh, up if you want to. Half an hour. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, actually, you're due to finish at 2.30, but if you can finish earlier than that, well done. There will okay. be bonuses in it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, as, the, uh, as um, Barry has said, you know, at 1st of December, so halfway through the year, we had a, a restructuring. That's when the actual property division was sold out. So what we're talking about here is the food business and the economic development business uh, together. Um, so it was a, a very like-for-like -like year. We carried on the good work, similar to last year, in respect of profitability, amount of days going through, etc., the real uh, change is as the uh, sheep milk has increased, we're producing more high-value product, and would have to uh, therefore bring on more staff, expert staff around quality and infant formula production because we're right at the high end there. So that's taken up some, some extra costs. I'll take the rest as read, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to. Um, just point out as far as our strategic direction, we are on target for um, the, the dryer. Uh, we have a consent and process. We hope that in the next few days we'll hear some good news, as well as uh, the signing of the various agreements that you agreed to, I think, some time ago now uh, at this chamber. Unfortunately, I'm unable still not to tell you who's the actual people involved um, until the actual agreements are signed, but I'm hoping in the next two weeks we can make that announcement. Um, so it is on track, the new dryer. And with that, I'll just hand it over to questions, really. I just have one question. Um, you and Barry um, alluded to this, that it's, you know, 
people and businesses in their teenage years, I think might have been the term you used or something like that. But is any of your business, and is it expected that any of your business will be continuous business, or you, will you, and I don't want to portray it negatively, but will you always be waiting next year for the next startup to come and start processing their product there? Like, like is there a big enough niche for just trial work, which is predominantly what you do, I think? Um, it's more than trial, it's market validation than just trial per se. So generally people are with us three to four years, it's about that period, okay. so they get the scale in market, and that's what we'll be doing. And so they either, either figure they can't sell the product, or um, they can't, yeah. it's just not economic, or they move off and build their own plant, or get someone else with a bigger plant to do their work, because they're... they're, they're Exploding. That's going, correct. Going, okay. That's correct. They've got to a scale that they can mm. either build. We do do some R and D, um, and all the big players, um, whether it be even Fonterra or if you name any dairy company, we do have one-off trials for them. Oh, yeah. and we do a fair bit of that. Uh, but our general work is trying to grow these businesses to a scale that can go and build a factory. We do have other where we have done some R and D, like the avocado business, and it's just not worked out, and so they haven't gone on. So it's a mixture of all those three. Okay, thank you. Oh, I've got no questions. Dave? <laughs> okay, Ryan. I was, I was intrigued um, <coughs> that you do the omega-3 and 6 powders for, was it New Mega in Australia? Yeah. Where do you source those, can I ask? Or? They have a special oil that's made for them. It comes from... Um, uh, two sources, uh, it's either tuna oil, specially made and specially purified, etc., and specially extracted. And What sort uh, of oil did you call it? From tuna. Oh, tu tuna. Tuna. I thought it said tuna. Tu tuna. Oh, um, and um, they also have algae oils, a special algae oil made for that. And we then threw it through, put it through a process which they have a patent on. Um, it's a... It's a, an ingredient that has to go into uh, every infant formula, really, that's made that particular product. And there's only really probably two players in the whole world, and they would probably have about 20, a high 20s market share. Um, it's, it's a very high valuable product, and New Zealand is one of their major markets. So we make it at um, Waikato Innovation Park. It then goes on to be used by, well, Sinlays and, you know, you probably heard of A2 milk, so that, all that um, infant form all has uh, that ingredient going Are those through. raw materials, the tuna and that, is that from New Zealand or that's from other... No, it's from other countries. So essentially comes it from. comes in and you guys just package it? Uh, it goes through it. a process before us to purify it and to extract so it's uh, concentrated and then we put it through a process um, without getting too technical. The process we put it through means um, you'd think fish, you know, would smell and things like that but we call what is encapsulated, and uh, that means when it sits inside a uh, can of infant formula, its smell doesn't come out. Uh, it remains in there, and therefore only, you know, the, obviously the Omega Omega 6 comes through, but not the, the bad odour. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Well, we've got a bit of time. Do you want to explain your um, limited liability partnership structure? <laughs> That could, that, that'll get us through till half past two. <laughs> and no one will be any the wiser. <laughs> no, I've got another meeting at five, Jim, and it's not going to work. <laughs> I never tire of those discussions. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. OK, um, I'll move the Waikato Innovation Growth Limited and Group Annual Report for the 30th of June 2018 be received. Is that the...? Yep. OK. Do I have a seconder? OK, Ger uh, Mallet, Southgate. Um, those in favour, aye. Those against, nay. Any nays? OK, passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate the work you're doing out there. <coughs> what? Get them, what is it? Do it to them before they do it to you. <laughs> that was the line, wasn't it? Be safe out there. I'll be safe out there, that's right. Well, who said do it to... I can't remember him dying.
saying. So everyone's okay with the um, limited liability partnership structure that the group is in? <laughs> we're waiting for some people to turn yeah. up. Stephen, we're up. We go? Yep, we've got a 2.30 break, but we'll go half an hour for the first report. First report. We'll second event. So we are now doing item 12 on the agenda, page 30, which is the ten, new 10-year monitoring structure. So this will be the only, well, unless we need more education, but this is, the, this is an educational briefing, or not briefing, paper, to explain the new uh, reporting structure as we go forward. Is that right? Thank you, Gary. Yep. Yes. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Right, we should all be on page 30 of the agenda. This report, as uh, Gary mentioned, allows me to introduce the new three-tier structure to reporting uh, and monitoring our, our financial performance. Uh, I suggest that we briefly look at um, the changes to the structure uh, and then uh, move on to each other, e each of the separate reports and address matters raised in that, which, given timing, will probably be after our next speaker. Um, the reasons for the changes in the monitoring report is largely to focus on two key risk areas. To put more focus on the financial strategy reporting, looking forward 10 years, and to put more focus on capital reporting, looking forward three years. If we go to page 31 and have a look at the graphic, there are three tiers to the monitoring report now. Whereas the previous report was, very annu was, was annually based, the new reports are based over 10 years for the financial monitoring, strategy monitoring, three years for the capital portfolio monitoring report, and one year for the annual monitoring report. The three reports are being prepared together and should be read together as one in order to get the full picture and the full story. The reports will be further developed and improved as we settle in on the new approach to monitoring. We have a number of ideas on improvements and we welcome your feedback. All matters included in previous monitoring reports are included in these reports except risk and opportunities, which has now been replaced with forecasting. And we'll talk a little bit more about forecasting later. Risk and opportunities was very annual and we need to track changes over a rolling three-year period for the capital monitoring report and over 10 years for the financial strategy monitoring report. The new forecasting approach is still being developed. For this report, two forecasting adjustments have been made, which we'll discuss when we look at the financial strategy monitoring report. In summary, these reports more, put more focus on our financial risk areas Collectively, they form a complete financial monitoring report and they add to what we have previously reported. Full stop. OK, thank yeah. you. His face just came up and I thought something's happened. Yeah, I didn't quite say that right. <laughs> He's having a stroke or something. <laughs> OK. Uh, Tracy, you got anything to add? OK. All right, I have a couple of uh, some questions already. Uh, Angela. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Stephen, and we'll get into the new three reports. But I just did notice, and I think this is the appropriate um, position to bring it up, there isn't, in any of the next three reports, there isn't any commentary or metric for actual risk management, given the, the fact that there is no resilience in this budget. Um, so I'm wondering if that's something you're still working on or is that something that's going to be reported in conjunction with these three reports to audit and risk? There's no commentary, no metrics, nothing around potential risks. Sorry, Andrew, can, I, Andrew, can I just ask you to... I'm not, I, I don't quite get your question. Uh, do you, can, so can you, uh, can you think of the, the previous reporting, so what, what's not there that you were expecting to see? Because this, this is important. It's a very good question you've asked, but I don't quite um, get it. Without getting into the details, uh, perhaps I'll just pick it up can again I, can, in the next well, report. But I'm during, just during the lunch break. Yeah. We had a discussion at, at staff, and and we've got a bit of repetition uh, around emerging issues, yeah. and um, 
the result of that discussion is we probably should be reflecting that in the financial strategy report in, in a risk discussion rather than emerging issues. Emerging issues are things that have happened, whereas risks are things that could happen. Um, and, and, and so, yeah. so we had a bit of a discussion amongst staff about that only, only an hour ago. And, and I think there's something in that, and that's something we need to develop. Yeah, so that's, that's Mr Chair, that's where I'm, okay. I'm leading to see some in some future reporting. Okay. Um, it is a better term than emerging issues. Yeah. But also I think given the, the incredibly tight uh, financial strategy we're going to be working in, and a lot of unknown factors, it would be good to have those in particularly... Um, well, the annual and the capital portfolio monitoring reports to have some kind of, and you know, I'm, I know it's crystal ball glazing, gazing all of this stuff, but if it's an emerging issue being relabeled as a potential risk, to have some also very high level possible mitigations in the future, just so the elected members have, um, or speaking for myself, have an eye on what could possibly happen and what we, so we've mm -hmm. got early thinking around what we could do, yep and maybe how much that might cost. But even if the cost is not there at this stage, just that I've got comfort that we, um, that the organisation knows that, so for an example, the slip that we might, um, a one risk mitigation could be, we go down this track, we go down this track. So once we sure. get there, we've already got some oversight of that. Yep. It is real authentic risk management. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I raised it because I feel it's missing in these reports and I wanted to know if it was raised at audit and risk. And we haven't really done that in templates well before. No. So it's an and opportunity, given these are new reports, to, to pull it into the templates now. And, and that's, that's exactly the purpose of this, so thank mm, you for that. Yeah. Stephen, can I just ask on behalf of Angela, I don't want to do anything on behalf of Angela, but um, is the answer to Ange part of Angela's question the answer might be that we are now going to forecast. So instead of having a budget, an actual, there will be another column there, and the, and the budget is what was set at the start of the year or the start of a reporting period, and it doesn't get amended other than by council resolution, mm -hmm. um, but which is very rare to amend a budget. Um, but certainly the forecasting will show the yep. impact of changes from budget flowing through. Yeah. Which, which gives you visibility at least of the financial impact of identified changes, am I right? Yes. And, and, and is that, so is that the, the, the kind key... of what you were concerned about, Angela? Oh, there's two. Yeah, I'm there's wanting two. more yeah, than financial, because we've oh, done okay. that yeah. in the yeah. past very well, and it's easy yeah. to see what's going to yeah. happen when you're, for, when you're forecasting, yeah. and we see is it a timing yeah. issue, is it a, did we undervalue something, blah, 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 blah. I'm wanting a, a much more future engagement with if this is an emerging issue that we're now calling a risk, if this happens in three years' time, what's kind of our possibility? Because I did have, a, if I can have, with your leave, I did have a conversation with the general manager and he gave me a high-level look at these early reports. And the conversation was a lot about there's just no resilience in this budget. This is going to be tough for us to handle. Mm -hmm. We need to have oversight really early. So as a really rough example, and I bring up the Rogers Rose Gardens, which I look over the Deputy Mayor will remember that, so will <laughs> a few others. Um, river slip, we've got no room to move. We've got, it's it's mm. an unbudgeted item. A possible mitigation for the risk could be we take $3 million off the Rotatuna Town Centre. And it, not, not to, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. so just that, that when we get to that, if we get to that, and we have to manage that risk really hard because, you know, there is no resilience in the budget, it's not a surprise to us. Because with respect, yeah. the Rose, Rogers Rose Garden was a terrible, and, and um, all due respect to our lovely GM over, over there sitting behind the Deputy Mayor, but it was like, you know, we said, cut some money, so we said, well, here you go and uh, we didn't have any oversight on the consequences. So it's a, it's a way to manage those consequences in a no surprises environment yep. mm, at a very That's high fine. level. Yeah. Is that clear? Yes, it is, because I mean, as part of, internally, we're gonna have to do that anyway. So you all you're asking is for us oversight. to bring that um, in, at a higher level to bring it to this committee, yeah. which is perfectly understandable. Yeah. So, and that's yeah. um, easy to do. Okay, cool. Thank you, Angela. Uh, you, you're done? Yep, Paula. Thank you. Just following up from that, because that was one of my concerns also, um, I get the, the, um, the tenure of the new three new reports and why they exist. 
Um, just remind me, or I think it would be useful just to refresh us all, actually, um, since the key projects report is gone, because it's absorbed into the capital portfolio monitoring, if I read that right, where does the reporting on the, um, on at a project level happen uh, on a wider set of outcomes besides just pure capital and finances? Um, just because we do make, it's a very complex business we're in, so we're making a lot of promises through the LTP, as Angela has alluded to. A lot of them are quite um, small relative to others and so on, but understanding what the trends on delivery of the community outcomes that we've agreed to in the LTP, because it's not all about dollars, it is actually about the outcomes as well. Where does that get reported? And does it sit alongside and sort of in, interact? I think, um, Councillor Fuller, I think the, yeah. the capital report, which is still evolving, can capture our promises to the community, and we were tracking towards that. Um, the, the whole purpose of the capital report wasn't to be financial. It's about showing the full picture, and the full picture includes our promises through the 10-year plan. So, um, Sure. There's a lot in the 10-year plan that some of its um, programmes with very little capital investment, but it's service level yep. delivery and things like that. So that's what I don't uh, want to lose sight on. Because, absolutely. Um, so, so there'll also be a quarterly, you know, the performance measures, the yeah. service performance measures that we you did as part of the um, tenure plan as well. So that comes through and gets reported every quarter through um, Sean's team. So the white, because um, because I think we all agree, and we know we've talked about it a lot lately, that the, the well-being's on their way back with this present government the four well-beings, and so we are going to have to have a clear way of saying we're meeting a set of outcomes that we've agreed to with the community. Yes. Um, I was just wasn't sure. You've answered my question a bit, I think, David. I wasn't quite sure how some of those fitted in capital projects per se. So just want to make sure that I, as a governor, can say, well, what happened to that? What happened to that service level delivery that we were going to improve? What happened to that small project over here that we were going to do? Um, and Angela's quite right, we have to be careful that we don't sort of rob Peter to pay Paul in some of the big scheme of things. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about is how do we align our organisation to this reporting structure such that it's not only that we bring reports here and can fully inform governance, but how do we, how do we um, direct and inform our organisation in terms of the process by which sometimes when decisions need to be made. So there's a lot of work going into um, thinking about how to do this most efficiently. Hmm. Um, current thinking is to do a quarterly cycle of wrapping up all um, all topics that are lying out there and making sure we can make an informed decision around that. Now, the, the challenge for us is obviously the 10-year plan capital program was put together by resolution of council. So um, while staff might come to the table with some uh, recommendations in terms of how to get past a, an, an issue within our constrained hmm. budget, which I must say is, uh, you know, we, we, what we've done is we've spent our debt to deliver outcomes for the community and it's about keeping hold of those. So we need to work through what an efficient way to, to get elected member sign off to uh, uh, any recommendations that staff might bring to address any issues with our financial strategy mm. because of unbudgeted or emerging issues. Yeah, and I don't want to wait three years till we start working on the next LTP to go, why didn't we do X, Y and no. Z? And that has... Unfortunately, there has been slippage at times. Um, One of the, the other thing is that I'm really interested in, and I've raised it before, but I've never really had um, an in-depth conversation with my colleagues around it about other forms of genuine progress indicators. So I do think there is a place for that in local government where we start um, talking with the community about what we deliver from a genuine progress point of view. We improve their lifestyle and their sustainability, the environment, all of those other good things. And I'm quite clear about this, but I'm not so clear about how we talk about the other topics. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> I am. I'm meeting different ways, new tools of addressing the well-beings um, so that we don't lose sight of what we're here for, which is the bigger picture. Yeah. There's a lot. He, was, eh? oh, he was copying my gesticulating. Yeah. There's far too much gesticulating going on. It's bloody. No, but I, I, I do think that's important. Okay. I mean, uh, sorry, Paula? No, no, I think I said it. We're not just here to report finances yeah. to the community. That's what I'm saying. James. Oh, thank you, Tracy. 
and Stephen. Uh, one thing I want to know about this is, um, will this new financial strategy actually help us identify financial issues or shortfalls um, earlier, way earlier than we have been? Because if we remember back to October, November 2016, we were told the books were fantastic. We find out at 11.30 at night on a, in February 2017 that uh, we're $12 million in the hole. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, got, I got the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think okay. there's a significant step up in the reporting that's before you. Um, last financial uh, finance committee, we were we were basically focusing on the current year, and um, and you know we've done a lot of work through the funding uh, through the ten year plan of um, creating transparency around everyday costs, everyday revenue, um, and we've got a lot of uh, more information that's coming. Um, the, the purpose of the three reports is to have the right conversation at these meetings, as opposed to uh, a whole list of financial information that doesn't really have a theme or a picture to it. What we're wanting to do with the 10-year plan is, unlike last finance committee, you know, last um, before the 10-year plan was struck, we want to actually make sure that we're taking a look at how we're tracking with the 10-year plan as we've struck it um, with updated information. And that's why that first report is really important, so that we have a long-range, long-term view um, you'll see later in the reports that we don't have any debt capacity. We don't have any more than $3 million to spend between now and the end of 2021. So decisions have to be made. And so um, it wouldn't be um, unforeseeable if we were to, at this meeting, come with recommendations but have a discussion at the Finance Committee about uh, what do we take out, what do we put in, so that everyone agrees to it. And that is every Finance Committee on a quarterly basis has that 10-year plan graph uh, set of metrics up there. So I think what we need to do is steer down steer down what the challenges are that Council might be faced that we didn't know at the time and um, and then to collectively um, uh, make the decisions, uh, have, allow governance to make the decisions so that we can move forward. Okay, I've written down yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, sorry, are there any more questions? Oh, can I just add to that, which David is exactly where I was going with my um, oversight on, on risk. It's great to have all of these reports, and I really like what, what you've done. But it needs, as you said, there's only $3 million in the next 10 years that we can effectively sort of play with unless we are taking something out. Yeah, three million so in the next. It's going to be a give and, give and yeah. take. In the next three years. Debt oh, sorry, in the next three years. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah next three years. You don't want any of your projects blowing out, do you? OK, um, just the uh, on page 31, paragraph 9, uh, talks about significant forecasting assumptions that, should they change, will have significant effects on the financial strategy, and they are growth, inflation, interest rates. I'd also like to suggest um, hitting our operating budgets be there, or balancing our books being one of those as well. Uh, I talk about that in the next report, uh, it, it, absolutely. OK, so that that is, OK, yeah, because that it's is not critical assu as well. It, yeah, yeah, but it's not an assumption. It's it's a bud it's it's the budget. We've got to hit our budget. That's critical. Yeah. But but these assumptions, are, uh, they're not things that we can can control. They will happen uh, to us, and we need to monitor them. OK, gotcha. And, and, and potentially adjust our forecast for them should they change. Just um, page nine... Uh, Page 32, para, uh, para 19, you say the report is jointly prepared for the development group and finance and brings service performance and financial performance, service performance and financial performance much closer together. Um, is that what, yeah. kind of addressing what Paula was talking about? Yeah, so that's what um, David was trying to allude to earlier around the capital Why reporting. Why didn't you say that? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's regarding the capital reporting. But, but Paula was also referring to non-capital stuff, and, right. and, and Sean is, and his team are working on a separate report for that. Yeah. Sean Hickey? Yes. Yes, yes two Seans. <laughs> <laughs> Okie okay. dokie. Paragraph, <laughs> paragraph seven is, um, dare I say it, not well written. What are you saying in that? I 
I think the point that um, David was making about um, the three million dollars. Um, so this this is we, highlighting we that because we, we didn't take the second. So we, we were at one stage looking at 9.5 increase plus another 9.5 increase. Yeah. We then went from a 9.5 to 9.7 or something, and then yeah. a 3.8, 3.8. Yeah, but, but we spent 18 months developing the 10-year plan, and, and yeah. we had the uh, task force, the revenue task force workshops, and we talked a lot about the financial strategy, and we used terminology, and we developed um, some thinking around that fi financial strategy. And, and by the time we had, had got through uh, to preparing the consultation document, we, we pretty had a very good understanding on, on that. And, um, that as in what? The, the financial strategy, oh, okay. yep. um, what, the, what, what affected our financial strategy and how our financial strategy uh, changed. In response to submissions, Council looked at the financial strategy and made some substantive changes to the financial strategy um, late in the, in the cycle, on the 31st of May. And, um, and it's taking so us, it's so taking sorry, us a while sorry, to Stephen, learn so what that means. So you're saying one of those changes was that instead of the second year of 9.5, we went to a second year of 3.8 and accepted some additional debt. Yes, yes. Okay. that, that so, was the so, essence so that's of the changes. What's, so that's why, we, that's why we're getting close to our 2, 230. Is that, is that what you're saying in here? Yeah, because the okay. last financial strategy, the, 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 the financial strategy that we uh, put out to consultation had higher revenue um, with being rates increases, um, which gave us future debt capacity, which meant that we weren't at the limit of our debt to revenue ratio. Okay, so the very last sentence, can I ask you to read it out loud? The effect of these changes yep. was to reduce rates increases, increase everyday revenues and cost deficits, or reduce surpluses, and maximise debt up to the debt limit. OK, can you see that sentence has actually got about five different things in it? Yeah, so, it's actually... So I just couldn't follow it. Yeah, so we did reduce the rates increases. Yep. We did increase the deficit in year one, because yep. we put out a proposal with no deficit, and in turn that reduced future surpluses, and we did maximise our debt up to the oh, debt okay. limit in year All three. Right. So those are the three essential changes that we made on the 31st of May that have led to quite a bit of thinking over the last two months in developing how we monitor and report and, and consider so how we stay within our financial strategy for the next three to so, six years. So those decisions are what made an already tight 10-year plan even tighter? You could say that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, OK. So, and that's what drove the importance of we need to get ahead of the changes by, the f by bringing in forecasting so that decisions made now, the implication three years later is visible to us straight away. Yes. Yeah. And that's what the, a, a lot of the balance of the other reports are about. And delivering our biggest capital program. <laughs> yep. OK, which you tell us about 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, this is a big capital program. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, any further questions? OK, uh, I'll move the report be received. This is simply a report to be received. Mallet. Bella, do you want to get on the record? <laughs> yeah, you're there now. OK. Myself and Bella. OK, those in favour, those against... Anyone against? Okay, carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, and Ryan is. Uh, it's getting too hard for Ryan, so he's going. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ryan. Cheers. I'm going to move to the last external. Yeah, they're here now, yeah. Do you want to do them now? Beg your pardon? Are you going to do yeah, we'll, we'll now? Yeah, we'll jump in there because they're there. Yeah, so five minutes early. <laughs> A beautifully managed meeting, this one, mate. Managed to offend half our community and get our meeting done five minutes early. <laughs> Item 18, 120, page 121. Thank you. Item 18, page 121.
Okay, okay councillors, we're on item 18, page 121 of your agenda. No, it's not. Agenda doesn't have a page 121. Yeah, it does. Oh, sorry, there it is. There it is. Only just yet. And then the actual report's in here. Thank you. Such a skinny little report for such a big thing. All right. Hello. How are you? Thank you. Very well. Good to Thank see you. you. Nice hey, to see Mark. you. Uh, okay, Mark is the CEO. Uh, don't know if you call you a CEO. CEO. CE or CE of enough. the um, Waikato Airport, and he's here to present his annual report. Thank you. He shoots it. Right, now look, I know you have received uh, the full uh, annual report from us. What I've got here today is an abbreviated presentation that we provided at our shareholder briefing a couple of weeks ago to the mayors and the CEs uh, and uh, one or two other respected members such as uh, Councillor Mallett. Um, so what I'll try and do now is just take you through the highlights of that presentation. Um, I think the first, uh, first key point to make is that, that the group had a very good year. Um, and there were a couple of key milestones during the year. We completed a 10-year strategic review of the group. Uh, and just to uh, sort of uh, remind everyone, we, we, we view internally the business in three areas of aeronautical property and tourism, which frames under RAL, the parent company, and then Titanium Park for property and uh, Hamilton Waikato Tourism. Uh, obviously, Jason, uh, you're updated uh, on Hamilton Waikato Tourism independently, so I'm just going to focus on the balance um, of the group activity today. Um, so look, very, and very much highlights here for the financials. Uh, the, key, the key points really are uh, that uh, up in the uh, pie graph you can see that the uh, business made an operating profit of about a million dollars. 800,000 contributed via property, uh, net income from property sales and 200,000 from the airport operation. I think the key point here is this is the first time since 2012 that the airport operation has made a profit in its own right. Um, and uh, you can see the, the trend graphs there of the last five years, both at a group level, moving from losses of you know, four to 600,000, uh, and then for the parent, the airport operation, losses of six to 800,000 now through to its first um, profit. And, that's, uh, and we'll talk a wee bit about the, the reasons for that uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, before we get to there, the statement of intent that, uh, that obviously is set uh, by the shareholders, the key point here is that the group um, really uh, performed in all of its metrics, both its financial and non-financial metrics, except for, you can see, one cross there, which was really the unbudgeted but strategic acquisition of the airport hotel that had a slight uh, impact on the shareholder ratio there. But other than that, uh, all metrics um, were met. So if we move in, into why did we achieve that, I think the key points up here are the firstly the passenger growth, up 11% year on year, which uh, follows a, a five, it was up prior year as well. And we also saw a capacity lift. So that's, I think, the positive aspect here is that in New Zealand have put more uh, seats into our market and we've taken that additional capacity and consumed it with greater growth. So we've moved our loadings from about 74 to 78%. Um, on some of our flight uh, peak hour, we, we're, we're up into the high, mid to high 80s. Um, so we do have some challenge on peak hour flights, but I, this is a, an overall across... Uh, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. And you can see down the bottom the, the, the fact that uh, Wellington represents a little more than 50% of our activity. Um, and I think the other key point that I'd bring to your attention is that the Christchurch sector continues to grow very, very strongly. So 18% growth year on year this year, following a similar growth last year. So uh, that's been, uh, and of course that then flows through to our income stream. Um, and what I would say here really is that uh, um, uh, our income has grown at a greater percentage than our passenger growth, driven principally by our property interests where we've had um, a significant increase in our land values which has led to higher um, uh, uh, rent reviews in terms of ground rentals, as well as some additional property leases. 
and our car parking revenue, our rates have remained unchanged, but our car park revenue has grown at 20%. Uh, again, that's about a demographic change in how the car park is used, and so more people, of course, parking. Um, from a shareholder uh, position, quite a strong investment. We invest about one and a half, generally one to one and a half million dollars a year in aeronautical um, upgrade of our assets. Uh, in addition, this year we have embarked on a couple of specific projects. One is the rescue fire uh, tenders, so we are fully refurbishing two tenders, which will take about two years, so take about one year each. Uh, that cost is about 350000 per tender. Um, versus about 1.3 million to buy a new one. So the, the business case certainly supported the refurbishment, which extends their life by another at least 15 years, as well as some major work around um, uh, replacement of rescue fire pumps and infrastructure. So that's about a 1.3 million spend this year and next year. And those of you that have been to the airport recently will see we've expanded the car park. We've added about 20% uh, capacity, so about another just under 100 car parks and we're completely replacing all of the control equipment uh, which will be replaced during November and December, which will give us the latest state-of-the-art uh, car parking technology, uh, which makes us ready for app-based technologies. It has license plate recognition technology, um, and it will be much more reliable. The pay station comes out of the main car park, and uh, it'll be a much better customer experience. Property. Uh, look, property, there's been a lot of activity in the year. Um, just to give you a, a very high-level view, we've sold about $2.2 million worth of land against a budget of $1.5 million. We purchased the hotel, as I've mentioned. We've also completed uh, ex uh, additional roading on our central precinct to open up more land to allow us to settle land sales during the year. We've submitted a private plan change to YPAR Council to relocate our entry points off uh, State Highway 21. Uh, we've finished the, the detailed design to open up the Southern Precinct, which is the land to the south behind the hotel, uh, which opens up about nine hectares of land, and we have already pre-sold conditionally on the private plan change uh, and their own due diligence about four hectares of that land as well. Uh, we bought a couple of strategic pieces of land, I'll show you on a land map, uh, which uh, provides uh, future-proof opportunities for, um, for the airport. Um, so quite a bit of activity. What does that mean, though, from a shareholder perspective? I think the reassurance here is that uh, we have about 330 hectares of land that the airport company owns. We have just under 200 hectares that's clearly identified for aeronautical purposes either currently or that we will require to future-proof the airport. Uh, you can then see the, uh, the yellow wedge, which we're endeavouring to grow. So that's our investment property that provides the annuity income to the group as we move forward. Um, and then the farm, the 98 hectares in green. Our 10-year plan contemplates uh, developing about only about 10 to 15 hectares of that land. And then the land that we will definitely sell over the next uh, uh, period of time, anything up to the next five to ten years, is in Titanium Park. So the net position is that we are acquiring land as well as selling it, but I don't expect our, our, our base level of land to move much more than a 10% less than we currently have today. Um, that's a map of the airport. It might be quite difficult for you to read. The, the, the only points I want to point out there are, are in purple. Right at the top of the map, you can see uh, the, the connection to the proposed southern links and the orange roading network. The land highlighted in yellow is already acquired by NZTA as part of southern links. You can see we've bought that lifestyle block, um, which um, uh, has the potential to provide connectivity from the expressway, from the interchange, down onto the green, onto the farm that we own. So that's really a, a long-term uh, play to hold that land. Um, and also the piece that juts into the green is the garden centre. We now have a first right of refusal to acquire that land. Again, it means the development of the farm eventually on that side of the airport, on that side of the farm is much more useful. Um, I won't go into any more detail on that map. So look, what does that mean looking forward? I said to you that we had completed a 10-year strategy. Uh, so last year we completed a 10-year property strategy. 
things had moved on radically in the, in the last 12 to 18 months, and the board elected to have a full strategic review of the group. Uh, Mike Poho uh, uh, worked with me on that, and I think, uh, and, and with the team and the board, and, and really what that strategy uh, has, um, I suppose, uh, delivered is that our undertaking to date has been on point. So there was no radical uh, change in the 10-year strategy. The group hadn't missed anything uh, uh, that it should have, um, and that uh, really this, the strategy now underpins what we have been doing, particularly around aeronautical, so the um, protection of future opportunities, driving passenger growth, driving income uh, in our aeronautical business, but protecting the core and very much the property play that uh, that I'll talk to you about in a couple of slides, uh, and tourism very much about its role in terms of the tourism opportunities plan and the key initiatives that uh, that underpin the tourism opportunities plan. What it did though was allow us to develop a model, a uh, financial model that we can now um, a. Uh, this is, I guess, the best case scenario, and my caution here is this is only a model, uh, and uh, it's our best uh, attempt at what we think will happen over the next 10 years. Do you forecast in your models? Yes. Do we, do we forecast, Gary? Was that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, and um, and this will be updated now every year as we work through our annual um, financial plan and how that impacts on our forecasting for the 10-year model. Um, so look, I think the key, the key points I would um, bring to your attention, in the, white, in the white box is the base aeronautical income, uh, in the blue box is what we perceive will be our earnings from uh, property related activity, and in the green is land sales over the next 10 years. To the very left, you can see year ending 2017 and 18, that provide a bit of context to the fact that we're not being that we're being uh, sensible about our forecasting going forward, uh, the green, the big green box here that you can see in 2020 is the conditional land sales we already have on Southern Precinct. Um, the green looks quite significant. What I would draw your attention to, though, is that we expect over the 10 years to, to sell our land at a much higher square metre rate than we are currently today. So the amount of land we sell actually reduces, but the, the income we derive off it increases, which is why. So that's sort of the model. You can see that the, uh, the EBT line, the yellow line, suggests that our... EBT is a little over 3 million at the moment in today's dollars, and we see that moving to over 9 million um, at the end of that 10 year period. Um, and there's some key um, milestones. Uh, we're in the middle of a landing charge review. I'll talk to that shortly. From a shareholder position, the balance sheet, I think what this is telling you is that uh, the balance sheet continues to strengthen during the 10 year period. Uh, yes, debt does increase. We see debt moving from about 13 million today to about 25 million to accommodate um, particularly our design build opportunities where we will ideally attract um, uh, tenants. We will build the buildings, we'll own the land and we'll lease it back. So we see um, the shareholder ratio dipping. The yellow line across is, is a reflection of an investment in a design build and then the recovery through income. But nowhere during the 10-year period do we forecast that uh, ratio sitting below 75%, which is the current floor we have in our statement of intent today. Um, airport, I think uh, the, the, the key points here, passenger growth, we continue. Uh, we're about to invest in a major piece of research, probably the biggest piece of research we've undertaken over the next three or four months to understand both the demand, um, so the demand side of the passenger equation, is there, is there a demand for greater services by Air New Zealand and or other airlines? Uh, but equally, what does the supply look like? Because it's okay to have the demand, but if the, if the airlines don't have the aircraft, don't have the route flexibility, don't have the resources or the priority to focus on Hamilton, then it's all for nothing. So we'll do this research which probably by March or April next year will inform us as to whether or not there's sufficient credibility in the research to then um, commence a, a detailed business case to take to the airlines. What we've found is that we have to do this work. The airlines um, won't. 
um, but they'll have all the questions we need to have the answers. So that's kind of the process there. The landing charge review, we're in the middle of a consultation, um, so I, I, I'll limit my comments here because we, we consult with Air New Zealand commercially and then we also s uh, consult with uh, the general aviation for argument's sake, L3. But what I can say is those um, consultations are going very well and we would expect to see uh, as a result um, a significant uh, lift in our earnings over the next uh, few years a result of what is really a very transparent process. It's a recovery uh, based on, on the investment we make and getting a fair return out of the assets we employ in our aeronautical business. Um, and uh, to date, as I say, that is, that is going well. Um, and then we'll be doing some further work on the car park. We will be looking at a reasonably significant terminal refresh over the next couple of years. We've just started work on that at the moment. It's been 14 years since the terminal uh, was extended and, and, um, and refreshed. So we have a view to, to look at that and that brief has grown, but um, uh, we will have, I, I, I think we'll be in a position at the six monthly update to the shareholders in March to sort of signal where we think that's going to take us. Um, property I've really covered off. Uh, our main focus in the next 12 months is about planning uh, and getting these precincts open, but a big piece of work on the northern precinct, which is the farm, as I've indicated. We are going to move, you might recall, half of that farm is, is zoned industrial commercial. Uh, um, a lot of the de development potential is p potentially tagged to southern links. Uh, we see it, of course, tagged to uh, Southern Links, to Peacocks, uh, now to the opportunity of kind of the airport through to Auckland and what does that mean. Um, so we need to have solutions for NZTA around transport and for WIPA around the obvious, uh, you know, three water solutions and, and infrastructure. So um, our intention is to invest quite heavily in that over the next um, 12 months. Um, hotel, you're aware that we purchased the hotel. Uh, we're currently in uh, discussion uh, with two operators uh, and I am hopeful that we will have um, a term sheet heads of agreement uh, signed within the next three or four weeks, which um, uh, would then bring an, an, op an operator into the hotel next year. Um, ahead, we have until January 2020, uh, however, we would like to move this forward into 2019. Uh, the board are committed to a significant upgrade of the property. We, we would like to try and achieve a four star and that's the basis on which we're conducting our negotiations with operators at the moment. So it's potentially an investment by rail of somewhere in the order of $5 million to, to really uh, bring that property up to um, a significant standard. Um, we see a massive opportunity not only around us, but of course now with the development of the golf course uh, at Loch Eel, and, uh, and I, we met with Phil Tautarangi, who of course is doing the course design, uh, and the golf club just recently. So we see lots of synergies, and that meeting was also with Mystery Creek. Um, so it's about how can we work as, as sensibly as neighbours to actually drive opportunities across that part of the, um, the region. And look, uh, almost finally, in our property strategy, we committed to delivering one million, um, additional one million earnings before tax out of our non-aeronautical opportunities. What this simply shows you is that we have a base um, out of our non-aeronautical earnings at the moment. Um, and uh, within that 10 year period, you can see gradually we climb above the one million. The contributors, uh, sorry, contributors there basically are obviously some improvement off the base income, so that's rent reviews and additional leases. Uh, the orange is the gradual contribution of the hotel and it has, a, it has the ability to drive about 600,000 EBT per annum into our, into our operation. The green is our farm. We are converting our farm use from a dairy unit into a uh, cropping unit from the 1st of June next year. Uh, and, the, and the nice sort of salmon colour up there is our design build uh, that, that we start producing some of those towards the end of the 10-year model. Um, so we have a clear plan there as to how that will deliver. 
So I guess in summary, um, certainly from a shareholder perspective, the 10-year strategy uh, contemplates the, the entire uh, s uh, funding by rail itself. Um, so uh, we, you know, we are self-funding um, and uh, and and self-sustaining in this sense. Uh, we see, uh, I think, the strategy delivers a, the, 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 the way we will proceed with our aeronautical business, the way we will proceed particularly with property in the context of this co con contribution, because as you know, Hamilton Waikato Tourism uh, obviously invests their funding straight back out into, into tourism promotion. Uh, and uh, I guess it's a, it's a bright future, subject to some of the cautions that we've already articulated to the mayors and the CEs, that we don't know what's around the corner in terms of regional strength, the, the general national economy, uh, some of the impacts of uh, arguably uh, opportunities such as peacocks have quite a significant input on how, how we can grow, particularly the northern precinct and those farm opportunities, but overall a, a pretty uh, strong future. Uh, sorry, one final point, and we paid a dividend, which I, I should have said up front, that of course we have um, declared our second dividend to shareholders, so of 250000 which is up from 200000 last year. It's still a modest dividend, but I think it's demonstrating that the business is uh, able to invest and also to pay a dividend, and the 10-year model uh, also reflects paying a dividend each and every year and an increasing dividend through the 10-year period. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for your sterling contribution, Sean. <laughs> sort, of, sort of sat there nodding off. <laughs> uh, thank you. Before we start questions, can I just ask members to remember that Mark gave us a very good um, update on what had happened and then a, a great view of what's going forward. Today we're primarily interested in what's happened, OK, so the annual report, because we will have a go when we're setting the um, statement of intent and all that sort of stuff to deal with what they're going forward. Now, I know it's, it's, it's tantalising to talk about doing things in the, in the future, and thank you very much for opening the door, Mark, for all that stuff, but can we try and address primarily um, what happened last year, because that's what we're doing. We're approving the, the year-end accounts. And someone's going to straight away ask about how we're going to get international flights or something. OK. So I will start with Mark. Um, Chair, but I was just wondering if I could move an amendment that we not only receive the report but congratulate the directors and staff on a job well done, um, because I think this is a really good result. And uh, I would suggest that we make it a wee bit more strong than just receiving the report. Um, I, I would really support that, except when next time they come back or any other CCO comes back and we don't append our thing mm. like that, does it mean that they've... No, not necessarily. That they're, think... they're for the chop next no, year? No, look, no, my reasoning okay. is that they've turned this thing and uh, yeah, we correct, have watched it. Correct, and that's... I mean, and, that, and that's been a process of, no disrespect yeah. to you, Mark, it's mm. been going on for about four, when we, when we changed the board, really, Sean, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, pardon? Yeah, we could note it in the minutes like that if you don't mind. If it's, yeah, I just if would it rather it's... it wasn't in the resolution because otherwise, like I said, mm. you've set you've set a new normal, and then if you don't do the normal, the guys must have done a crappy job, and that's not right. I don't think we're setting a precedent. I just thought it was it was worth putting okay. in the re yeah, resolution. Are, are you happy uh, if we note it, note it in the minutes that, that the uh, committee? Yeah, that's yeah so it's no big deal. Okay. Um, yeah, as long as it's noted, that's absolutely okay. fine. Yep. S sorry, um, I can't. Have, have so, we moved? Is, have we moved in a second yet? OK, I'll move um, that the report be received and that the minutes acknowledge the superb effort done by the board. Mark, do you want to be yep, I'll second that. included? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, it, yeah. might, it might be helpful in the future. Mark, and we'll get Simon <laughs> in there, and who else can we put Scott, in? Scott, my finance uh, oh, Scott out the manager back there, yeah, 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 all right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? You're going to get music I there, think actually. management's fine. The girls that make the coffee out there are bloody good too. <laughs> Great, now that's a cool okay, I'll, I'll save my... Um, my pay the booth and that make, uh, conference oh. venue questions for another time. That's great. Because it could take okay. a long time. So do we have a second? Uh, OK, mallet hunting. OK, questions? Oh, sorry, Martin. Yeah, just, just a statement that obviously, and realise when you come back with statement and intent, there'll be uh, considerable interest around the freight goods and you know, the issue of the railway line, long term. Um, links to the to the airport, and probably um, 
really wanting to fine tune in terms of what is the synergy um, between Auckland Airport and our airport for two reasons, you know, the connectors um, with an international airport, and I recognise the, you know, the, Air New the previous Air New Zealand commuter service, but also opportunities um, once the expressway is completed, particularly with Southern Links, given that we're just an hour and a half drive down from Greater Metropolitan Auckland. I know primarily they may be going through Auckland Airport, but what scoping has been done in, in a sense that this is the potentially major Central North Island Airport, but also another hour and a half from particularly South Auckland around flights and stuff like that. In other words, some of us will drive to Auckland for a perceived cheap deal. In time, that may also come the other way. But Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, with the um, hotel, um, you, you say four star. Is that is that going to be really focused around? You know, obviously, can, you know, because fly in, fly out conventions, links with Mystery Creek, that kind of thing. Look, uh, correct, it's, it's a, the opportunity is general. So mm. certainly conferencing is a significant opportunity. It does yeah. well at conferencing even as, as mm. it stands today. Mm. We've also got the added benefit of the conferencing that we've got in, in terminal as well as the conferencing at the hotel. Sure. Um, so I think this is, a, for us, this is a, a, a tourism opportunity um, mm. because uh, it's a conferencing opportunity mm. Uh, and um, and it's a local um, it's a, a local FIT weekend stay, um, but and and meetings look, we can attract much more activity I think during the week with a with a better standard of room accommodation. Right. So often it attracts day conferencing, yeah. but not two three day conferencing. Uh, and certainly our business case uh, suggests that there is more opportunity for Rao to to make that up to upgrade it in terms of improving the occupancy and the revenue per room than, than it is to perhaps just, if you like, leave it as a three star and, and um, throw a bit of paint on the wall. Sure, sure. The, the other thing is, um, you know, with, with your passenger surveys, and particularly since, you know, historically the Trans-Tasman stuff for now is gone, um, What's the sort of the boundary where your, your, your clients come from? Because obviously I'm aware of Tauranga and Rotorua airports, uh, but I'm, I'm interested in, in sort of how far you, you know, you're just getting some idea, if you like, of that circle of, of what, what we service. And some of this research we're about mm. to do will help mm. inform s more of that information, mm. but I think what I would say, them, and, and it, it almost goes back to my point about the car park growth, mm. Mm. The, the, the demographic using Hamilton Airport is growing, mm -hmm. ge ge so that geographic, so you'll find, in fact, in, in our last survey data, we certainly found that people uh, that live in the, in the Bay of Plenty, Rotorua, Waikato, will uh, look often at the three airports in terms of deciding Often, often based, of course, on fear, but also on schedule, and uh, so, so we are getting people. We, you know, if you like, we 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 have leakage to places like Tauranga. We also sure. receive them. And your comment around uh, Bombay's uh, South Auckland, uh, and uh, I think is a growing opportunity for us because when the expressway is complete, you know, it's probably a forty-five minute drive from the Bombay Hills to Hamilton Airport. And you'll be able to do it day in, day out, uh, without a problem. This is the problem, getting in, yeah, of getting I mean, north to, or to Auckland City or um, to Auckland Airport. I guess um, is is the sort of you know the old you know where you used to be able to do your commuter flights and all this stuff to Auckland. Is that sort of under your watch, or is it, is it just the, the, yeah. this is part of the research? So right. is there a you know so is, is there a business case? Um, and interestingly enough, some of the anecdotal feedback, and I won't say too much here because it is, but some of the early second tier airline anecdotal feedback is um, we're not sure there's a market there. We're not, you know, we're concerned about fog days mm, with their sure, aircraft types. Uh, now, now, our argument is we've had less fog days than, than uh, you know, Wellington and Christchurch this year. So some of it is about providing fact versus a fiction. Um, but it will, it will pick up the Hamilton-Auckland opportunity if there, is, if there is one. There certainly isn't one 
Uh, there wasn't one a year ago. We did a lot of work with Auckland oh, Airport sure. and ourselves, but that sure. was based on a much larger aircraft type than what a second terrier line would operate. Yeah, yeah. And the, the other, um, the, you, know, you, you alluded to other airlines. I mean, obviously, yep. that's an ongoing thing. I, I don't know, and I assume that's just you doing ongoing research and doing ongoing cases to attract... Absolutely, and we keep talking to them, but uh, as I say, I think, uh, hopefully I'm, I'm made clear, we have to now talk, it's okay to engage, but if you can't engage with substance around sure. what the opportunity is, then the conversations uh, are easily derailed. Is, is it also safe to assume, um, with the exception of Palmerston North, the viability of other sort of links, a la New Plymouth, Napier, Gisborne, is, is, is pretty not, not there at this point? I, I think that's right. I think there is there is certainly uh, 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 what we do know. Of course, it, we, we do receive a reasonable bit amount of data here, um, but often it's a segment, so it might even. Um, uh, uh, but what I can tell you is that destinations we know roughly how many people are onward flying uh, to uh, Nelson, to Dunedin, sure. to Invercargill. Um, uh, and uh, but of course that's uh, at the moment that's uh, that's uh, not a, a demand that we can actually do a lot about in the sense that we don't know what the opportunity would be yeah. if there was a direct service. At the moment there isn't. What we do know is that uh, regional New Zealand there's there's only a certain distance turboprop flights will fly. If, right. if the flight's any more than so Hamilton Christchurch is the longest turboprop yes. flight, yeah. uh, and that arguably anything over an hour. Mm. Is, is considered quite a long time to be in a turboprop plane. So you are governed, and that was my point around the uh, supply model. There might be an opportunity, but the airline might say, look, we can do, we can do two or three flights to Nelson Wellington and back rather than one flight between Dunedin and Hamilton so we can make more money on alternative routes. So sometimes the route can even be sustainable, but it may not fit the airline operating model. Do I understand that in terms Martin, of... Martin, right. um, not yep. a single question about the accounts, and every question was about the future, I, and I was, which I is was, coming I up was next time he'll be in this room. I was resolving to ask about the accounts, yeah. and, and for some reason it slipped so away. So you asked the balance totally, You've been extremely you? tolerant, okay, thank and, you. and the only other um, thing we would ask around statement, you know, when you come back with statement intent, be quite a bit of interest on, on if the Christchurch link can be grown in terms of its, its hub-spoke stuff and... and um, you know, what What does that particular... And I noticed there's a, you know, release... You did a release on some extra flights to both Wellington and Christchurch. Correct. And the opportunity and whether there's a wider catchment that would find Hamilton to Christchurch link without the hassles of Auckland or... OK. You know. And happy to do that. I would I would caution here, though, that these are very much decisions made by the airline. Of course, yes, um, sure. And, and our ability to influence is exactly that. Yep. OK, yeah, thank no, you. No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Mark. And this is really about the accounts, because a big part of the accounts is the car parking. Um, the booth, um, you're saying, can you just elaborate on the changes to the, the car parking payment options and, so, and what you expect from them? Uh, so, look, what we, uh, in essence, the, uh, the central pay station has been removed. Yes. So, so there'll be pay stations closer to the terminal. Lovely. And there'll just be, at the moment, light for light replacement, entry and exit barriers and equipment. What it does do, though, is, as I say, it provides us with licence plate recognition, which yep. we won't switch on immediately, but it, but eventually um, you go to a situation where people don't even need a ticket, don't even need to pay. Right. It reads the licence plate and charges the licence holder. Um, so that's, that's where we're all heading. Wellington Airport are trialling it at the moment. It's, yeah, not, with, yeah. it's not without um, challenges, yep. uh, which I won't go into here, but um, that's where we're... But in the meantime... No, we already have tap and go. We already yeah. mean, we already have the process. If you put your credit card in on entry and use the same credit card on exit, you don't have to worry about ticketing. Mm. Um, so it's just really an efficiency there that that uh, the customer will see. Right. But the booth is moving over towards the terminal. Terminal. Yeah. Right. Thank yep. you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. I see. I see no names down to ask questions, so I'll move that the report be received. Mark Bunting has already seconded it. Is there, is there any debate? All right. Um, I'll, those in favour, please say aye. Those against, nay. There are no nays. Right. Carried unanimously. And 
despite what I'd say, you guys have done a great job. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everyone. Passed that on to John, but I told him that last time I was out there anyway. Absolutely. And sorry, by the way, my apologies that none of the directors could make it today um, through various commitments. That's because so we don't have the same sort of cakes as you do it there. <laughs> no. Maybe they thought I was safe on my own today. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Okay, now we're moving into the stuff that will become the bread and butter of this committee. Pardon? Yeah. What you call, that's what you call the bread and butter, right? Potatoes and veggie. Okay, so we're on item th 13, page 34. Is there any particular order we should, yep. is, this, is this the rational order that's to go through? Okay, right. Financial strategy monitoring report. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Stephen and Tracy, howdy. Can I start, Gary? Oh, yes, sorry. Go yep. ahead. Sorry. Yep. This report focuses on the key financial strategy metrics and forecast changes uh, to this. The financial strategy was modified in response to submissions, and today is our, op our first opportunity to come together and get to grips with what it means and how our monitoring of it will be developing. Firstly, we must change our focus from balancing the books to debt to revenue ratio. This is the measure that for the next three to six years allows for the financial sustainable the financially sustainable delivery of the 10-year plan. If we were to breach a limit, there would be consequences. If we go to page 38 and have a look at the graph, top of the page. Uh, just a bit of administration. Uh, first, uh, we've developed the graphs in, in all three of these reports um, using a, a colour scheme. Um, where blue represents the approved budget, green represents the forecast budget, and charcoal or grey will be the actual figures. And in writing my notes for this, I noted that we got this graph wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 2000. What a fantastic start. Yeah, great start. <laughs> it gets better as we get into the, some of the other reports. Um, the 2016, 17 and 18 years are actual, so they should be grey and they will be in the next report. They're currently blue, aren't they? They're currently blue and they're not budget, they're actual. Yeah. I realised that when I was writing this. So um, hopefully uh, that colour scheme will help us uh, be clear on what we're looking at. Um, so back to the numbers. Um, if you can look at the 2021 year of the debt to revenue graph, or year three, you may notice, depending on the quality of your printer, a very thin sliver of white between the blue bar and the 230% limit. This is the gap that is very important to us now and for the next three years. It represents our available debt capacity for the next three years. And that number is 3.1 million. This is all the debt capacity we have budgeted for the next three years. If we just Stephen, can I just, just to add clarity to that? What, what you're saying, I think, is all other things being equal, where we stand now, as a consequence of a tiny change in rates and a tiny change in one other thing, and I can't remember what it was, that that is where we'll end up in 2021, all, all other, other things, things being, being equal. equal. Yeah. yeah. The all other things being equal is um, a statement I suspect you're going to hear a lot of times mm. Because, Let's um, get an acronym for it, shall we? Because <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we model a particular scenario, that model will always be all other things being equal. Mm. And as I go on to say in this note, all other things aren't equal. Um, but um, So the example Sorry. I've got here, if we, if we were to spend the unbudgeted $3.1 million today, we would have no unallocated debt for the, until 2021. In fact, the consequential finance costs of spending that 3.1 million today would put us over our 230% limit. Uh, 
While this budgeted debt capacity is small, it does mean that rates increases can be kept at 3.8 per cent. Now we can maintain all of our services and we will deliver our biggest cap capital programme ever and we will find efficiencies of $7 million in that three years. Every variance, as Gary pointed out when we talked about the previous report, every variance to everyday costs, everyday revenues and costs balancing the books, whether it be a deficit or a surplus, will affect our debt capacity. In the years that we have a surplus, we have budgeted to repay down debt. Any variance to our capital spend will affect our debt capacity. And then any change in assumption, as Gary pointed out when we discussed the, the overview, will also affect uh, our debt capacity. So there's a number of moving things. The green columns will represent our forecast result as we adjust for those factors as they occur over the next three years. Uh, and so on. As I said uh, in speaking to the previous report, we're still developing our business rules uh, around how we manage forecasting. Uh, but in this report, we have... Stephen, uh, sorry to interrupt you again. Yes. Can you explain what you... Because I don't know what you mean. I think I know what you mean when you say our business rules about forecasting. Are you saying that something will be classified as a something that changes the forecast. Are those the rules you're de trying to determine? Yes. Yeah, so there'll be some, for there'll some, be some forecasting adjustments that will be within a year and within budget, and, that, and, and that, that'll be our phasing. So there may be some phasing forecasting adjustments. They, they'll be inconsequential. Mm -hmm. There'll be forecasting adjustments between years, um, and we need to be clear on who has the delegated authority to make those decisions. Um, we need those decisions to be made in the context of the whole business um, and, and things like that. And, and so we've, we've had some discussions around this, uh, the role of the Capital Development Board, the role of senior leadership team, how we collect that data, um, but it's still very much developing. And, and, so, and so I'm not prepared to say that we have a, a, a clear yeah. set. So, so is there a set of rules or a manual, so to speak, I'm talking colloquially, there will be. that will be developed over time that allows Sean or, or Lance or someone to okay a spend and then a process whereby that spend, you know, which is an unbudgeted spend, that there's a process that that spend gets into the forecasting spreadsheet, and I'm using colloquial terms here, um, without having to come to a council, but some things will have to come to council, some things will have to go to Richard, um, and they have to be reported within such and such a time, or they have to be reported immediately. Is that what you're talking about? That's Because this is, yes. I think this is a bit of what, and I could be wrong, totally wrong what you were asking about before, Angel, but this is what I thought you were talking about, is, is how on earth do we make sure this great concept gets executed? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So I think, uh, sorry, Stephen, I think what we need to do is provide guidance to the organisation on how it fits in. And uh, calling them rules is the right thing. The rules are, if you're going to, you know... Some of the things to think about is that if we understand that there's an unbudgeted issue and someone raises it today, how do we know that that issue is the most important issue as opposed to something that's going to be raised tomorrow? And so we need to find a window of which we collect all these... So, so at the moment, if you go back to my quarterly review of the financial strategy, we could say that the first month of that quarter would be to identify what issues are pressing that are unbudgeted for, unforeseen, that we need to deal with. With the next four weeks being one whereby we will investigate them to understand the full impact of those, all of those issues, um, and the last four weeks to be forecasting a recommendation to this committee. Now, delegations will help us make minor adjustments without um, governance needing to know about it, but the larger items, we, we will need guidance from um, elected members. Um, we will also track um, on the larger items uh, a, a sort of a schedule of movements so that you can understand exactly what has happened since the budgeted position of the year to through to what decisions have been made that have brought us to our forecast position. So it makes sense to do it on something like a quarterly basis where we, we can not 
um, have a reaction from the organisation when one thing happens, but to have a process where everyone knows how to fit into, where we can make some informed decisions about how important each item is and how we, what decisions we're going to make as a result of that. If you remember the 10-year plan discussions at the 11th hour, we took out a capital piece of capital programme, Borman West, I think it was, or East, um, so that we could fit within our financial strategy. That was an example of a decision that needed to be made so that we could have a forecast that would take us forward and not breach any self-imposed debt limit, debt to revenue limit. So, so we just need to make sure that we've got a slick process that isn't cumbersome, doesn't duplicate efforts, that doesn't waste your time on smaller things that you've delegated authority to staff, but um, gives you enough visibility in, in the presence of Paul not being here to take care of our promises to our community so that we're not going to um, all of a sudden skew our capital program to something um, that doesn't deliver, um, which again again is some, some of the great work that uh, Chris is putting together in terms of understanding how we can deliver the capital program for less, for less but, but deliver the same community outcomes and that's about challenging our scope and it's about creating extra capacity and um, extra opportunities so that if an unforeseen event does occur that we can actually refer to the good work he's done to actually take up take up that unforeseen event. So I'm going to apologise for some repetition because um, it's going to be easier for me to read my notes or be quicker than try and take out the bits that David said <laughs> for me. <laughs> That's all right. Um, but um, so yeah, so, so if we look at page 37, I was just starting to talk about um, the forecasting changes that we have made. So we made two forecasting ch changes, and one of, your th one of the things you'll see in that table is, is authoriser, um, because we're quite keen that, that, that we're clear that there is a delegation to make that change. Um, and so we had greater than budgeted rates um, revenue um, as a result of um, our valuer processing much more in, in growth um, into the database than, than, than we had budgeted. And so that's provided a, a $570,000 um, benefit. Um, which is um, always a good way to start on a fin tight financial strategy. And of course, uh, that benefit then, then flows out over, over the, um, over the uh, 10 years uh, as, it, as it will get rates increases on the rates increase as well as additional growth on the higher base. base. Um, so, so that's uh, in there. And then um, this committee made a decision at its last meeting to approve the deferred capex uh, and um, while we had budgeted uh, for the uh, interest um, uh, for the for the for the debt element and the interest element uh, of um, deferred capita, capex, uh, we hadn't budgeted for um, a reduction in uh, depreciation. So so we identified that, and there's another two hundred fifty-seven thousand dollar benefit in there. So we started off with a couple of benefits, but, but we've talked about some emerging issues, uh, such as uh, slips were mentioned earlier. And, um, and, and so we need to um, uh, consider, <coughs> consider that, oh dear, excuse me. <coughs> Bad throat's an emerging issue, is it? It is. I was standing too close to David. Um, <laughs> I've been sitting two metres away from <laughs> for the whole day. Uh, and so, financial, um, so emerging issues uh, could have finan adverse financial strategy impact, and, and there are emerging issues uh, identified in the annual, and annual monitoring report and the capital portfolio monitoring report. We've got some repetition in, in the reports in this space, and I don't think it's quite working right, and, and, and we're going to work on that, because one of the things we're trying to avoid with three reports is, is saying the same thing more than once. Um, I want to particularly draw your attention to page 39, paragraph 39, uh, under emerging issues. And it sort of picks up on, on what David was saying. Emerging issues and forecasting changes have the potential to significantly impact our financial strategy. How and when we respond to these needs to be thought about. A first cab off the rank approach may not be the best outcome for the city. However, we don't know what tomorrow holds and we can't wait forever to make a decision uh, as that won't serve the city as well. 
We can model the impact of a single decision on the financial strategy, all other things being equal, but of course, all other things keep moving too. We're developing some business process to support prudent decision making. Our challenge is to deliver and to fund a capital program, keep rates increases at 3.8 and stay within our debt limit, with particular emphasis on 2021 to 2024. To These dates are a little way off today, so we have some time to make considered decisions taking account of the many inputs that are that go into our financial forecast. Before concluding, you may be wondering why I haven't talked about revenue and the 2.3 beneficial effect it has on the debt to revenue ratio. You heard a lot about this during the development of the 10 year plan. It was important to the development of the 10 year plan and the financial strategy that we started with. It's still important. We must meet our revenue budgets to maintain our debt levels and our debt to revenue ratio. But what we have learnt is that revenue only provides a 2.3 effect in the year that it is earned. Extra revenue in 2020, for example, will have little impact on the 2021 $3.1 million debt capacity. So in conclusion, the monitoring of the financial strategy has never been more important. Our capacity for unbudgeted spending, whether it's OPEX or CAPEX, is limited to $3.1 million over the next three years. Stephen, a, thank you, yep. Stephen. Can I just test what, what you said yep. two, two sentences back? Yep. A dollar of additional revenue, I think you said, doesn't make, uh, only makes an impact on the first year that you get that revenue. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so if we get an extra dollar today, then we increase our debt capacity by $2.30 this year, yep. but it so, has no so, effect and, on and next year. And if that year. dollar doesn't, if, and if we don't get another extra dollar next year, we can't, our, our debt capacity stays the same. Is that all you're saying? It, yeah. So if our revenue stays the same, our debt capacity stays the same? Yeah. Couldn't you have just said that? Yeah. Sometimes it helps to say the same thing different ways, different way. so we, okay. we all, all right. get it. Okay, all right. No, I just wanted to make yep. sure that that was what you were saying, yep. and it was. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions first. Angela. <clears throat> just one question on, for clarification. Page 37, uh, point 24, just the bottom, under discussion there, with the... Um, revenue impact of the 570,000. The text down the bottom says this increases no effect on existing ratepayers. Uh, you're talking about um, while it affects the bottom line of the budget and will wash up at the end, you mean it doesn't affect the current ratepayers because we've already set the rates for them. Is that what that, that does mean, that? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so All existing ratepayers got, uh, aside from the changes in in, in the rating policy, that the general rates increased by 3.8% plus growth. Yeah. The 570,000, and, and we estimated growth, but we underestimated mm. by 570,000. So we got more onto our books. Yeah, no, no, I, no, yep. Yeah, yep, no, I understood that, but I think the answer to my question was yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Thank you, Tracy. Just, just, just some feedback because this is the one of the first new three yes. reports yes. that will we will be monitoring and measuring against our new financial strategy. Um, I felt that there was a dis, a slight disconnect for me um, on page thirty six when we talk about um, and it may be a conversation that you have with um, Council McPherson as chair of G and I. I felt there was a little bit of a disconnect with when we are when we are looking at um, point eighteen says consideration of significant forecasting assumptions. So yeah. our, the big assumption for us is is managing growth, right, yeah. and how we're going to manage that capital project, um, capital program over ten years. The only context in this, and this is a monitoring strategic monitoring report, was really just a reference back to the growth indicator report that gets reported to Council McPherson's committee with a text that says there are no indicators supporting a change in the growth assumption. So I just felt if this is going to be the primary monitoring of our new financial strategy with growth being the big thing and everything relies on that, our debt capacity, all of it, revenue relies on that, it just felt a little bit disconnected that there was only a 
one or two bullet line bullet points there. And within that report, um, there's still for me missing the overarching uh, what's actually happening out in the world with the things that we can't control. And I think somebody raised the price of fuel. I mean, we have a massive um, amount of fleet out there, and petrol's risen, what, 10 cents in the last 10 days? So, and um, you know, economy is changing, export and trade is changing. We are part of the OECD. Um, there's, no, there's nothing in that growth indicator report that's, that's a higher level wide enough of the things, what's, what's happening out there in the world. Again, it's that real forward thinking that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So kind of two things there, yep. but really there was just a little bit of a disconnect um, for me being how important growth is and how much our CapEx program is relying on it in terms of you, you're presenting to me that this is a monitoring report of that financial strategy, but there's you'd, all you're saying to me is there's nothing that's... Uh, there's no indicators based on that report. And if I can say that that report, we have a disclaimer on the bottom of that that says it's general information and shouldn't be used to measure anything. And yet that's, that's what exactly what we're doing. Well, I, I have so, said it's retrospective data as well. Well, which makes it kind of worse. Yeah. You know, so I'm still looking at that forward stuff. This is a big program. So I'm really looking for us to stretch ourselves there. I agree. Um, part of the teeny pain. Discussions we talked about needing to be agile. If growth slowed down, we need to turn off the tap with some of our leading infrastructure, right? So we're very, very aware of that. Um, one of the things we don't want to do um, is take um, data on a quarter basis that would, say, scare the horses and not really see it as a true indicator. It could be just a cycle, yeah. <coughs> cycle blip. Could, um, yeah. so, so we need to continue to develop how best to bring that story to either this meeting or the growth or infrastructure meeting so that um, we can have a good solid uh, basis for giving an update in terms of where we think our our growth uh, forecasts are in yeah. alignment with the 10 year plan. Yeah. So and we still need to work on that. Okay, so so the two, two things there, if you're gonna leave that, that growth indicator report there, it needs to be expanded in my view. Yeah. Um, and I still feel it's disconnected from this. Yeah if this yeah. is to serve as a financial strategy monitoring report. Sure. It, it's, it's part of that, um, in that genre of not wanting to relitigate the whole 10-year plan yeah, because I get we've got that. a few extra me metrics, but yeah. when, when is enough um, yeah. signs, we're going to respond to that as being a shift in our original yeah. thinking that's back I mean, into things the happen plan. so quickly with petrol. Um, yeah. Inflation's just gone up to 1.9%. Well, I mean, even if it goes up to 2%, that's, that's sure. OK. That's, that's not earth-shattering at all. Um, just a very naive question. Do we actually have an economist on board? Um, he works for Waikato Chamber of Commerce now, I think. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, not we, telling we the have, CEO what to do, we, but I'm just no, wondering No, 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 we have... We, have um, we, we are... One of the growth group. Yeah, one of the growth group, and we link into Burl, as you know, through the Waikato University, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes it's good to get a lot of different... Um, thinking around this topic mm. rather than just believe, drink our own Kool-Aid. So, yes, we have some skills in-house, but yeah. we also litmus test that and peer review our thinking with other organisations. Because I know with respect to the 40, whatever it was, 41 chartered accountants, uh, including the elected member uh, over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that's right. Met two, two chartered Isn't accountants Dave now. Isn't chartered <laughs> no. Yes, he is. Um, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to... See feel there is a gap there, not for me to tell the CEO uh, who to employ, but... Yeah, no, we'll bring that. When, when, we, when we finish our thinking around how we're going to mm. inform elected members on yeah. how we're tracking and our growth assumptions, because, we'll, yeah, we'll it, bring it, more information about how we do that. It's about bringing that world view and looking past um, ourselves to keep ourselves on track, actually, and safe and yeah. knowing what's going on in the world. Yeah, it'll it be interesting in it, with inflation, because um, Bill... Uh, uh, did the forecast for the whole sector and, and we based our LTP on that and yeah. every October they update that forecast so yeah. that's um, and it's just, just been happened. just yeah. about to be published uh, and there's yeah. a presentation coming up on that and one of the key things uh, I'm going to want to find out from that presentation is is what um, Ganesh Nana's view is on, on, on the recent fuel things. Yes. But, I think, I think but we're also looking long term so, so yeah. it, you know how, how we adjust for that and when we adjust for that those are things we need to work out. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, as important as understanding the trend is being ready to do something about it. 
And so there's a lot of work going on internally in terms of how do we respond to changes in our um, our key assumptions and, well, and, and make sure well, the that we make decisions. Which, them, is, don't you? which is still part of the questions I was raising with a couple of reports ago sure. about that risk yep. here. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Um, Bella. Just a few questions. One, and this might be more appropriate for the Treasury side of things, uh, you only report on one covenant, and I understand you, you monitor the others internally. At what, what is the decision-making process, and this is probably a lot around risk and any unforeseen changes, will you decide to report that at a governance level? Is there a... a so so, so, so the, this is a financial strategy report, and... Um, in developing a 10-year plan, you, you, you're required to have certain measures um, under legislation, and, and one of those is a, is a limit on debt. Um, so while in your Treasury policy and in your covenants you may have multiple ways of measuring um, your, your covenants, um, the choice was to choose debt to revenue because that's the one that we hit the most, that's the one we're up against. I could imagine a different environment where interest rates are much higher and the, the percentage um, of, of interest costs to revenue, revenue um, it would, would be a relevant measure. Um, but for the period of this 10-year plan, that's what we chose as, as a relevant measure. So that's in terms of the financial strategy. Can I, just add to that, of can I just add to that, Stephen? The chap who was here from local government fund, uh, what's it called? Local government funding agency. That is also one of the metrics they use to. Uh, it's a debt to revenue. Ours is our, our, at the moment our ratio is two two thirty percent, two hundred and thirty percent. Their um, level is two hundred and fifty percent. So we're we're a bit below theirs. But that is another one one of the big reasons that that's our primary funder. And they use that metric, debt to revenue, as a um, as a big test for them. So the other covenants um, are addressed in the Treasury report, which is attached as is at the end of the um, annual monitoring report, and that report is under development as well. Okay. Um, my other question is, uh, in terms of emerging issues, and this is probably more relevant for the chartered accountants in the room. <laughs> Um, you know, if there's anything on the horizon, such as the introduction of hedge accounting, etc., would you raise that here uh, in terms of the impact it would have on our financials or lease accounting? Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay, so that will be raised within these reports, and we. Yes, because um, a lot of what we do, especially in the treasury space, is um, done on via policy, um, and obviously we've set that policy. Um, I think we're bringing the investment and liability policy to the next committee, actually, um, for review. So what what we report on again is based on what the policy um, tells us, what tells us to do essentially. So again, if there's anything, any changes that we want to do, that we undergo on that policy at that particular time. So I would assume that the forecasts in terms of the 10-year plan hasn't taken any of that into account, and if there's an adjustment, you'll reflect that at that point. Correct. Yeah. yeah. That was part of the forecasting process. Thank you. Thanks, Bella. Rob. Thanks. Um, my question is around, um, we talk, you've talked a lot about the capital program. Um, my question's around the discipline that we will have in place over the next 12 months in terms of our revenue expenditure. And I ask that question because most of the, or almost all of the 9.7% rate increase, as I understand it, was to help fund us keeping our assets that we already have up and running. And when I look at um, the first two months, and I appreciate two months is two months, we are already $4.2 million ahead of our budget. And I look across and I look across at page 88, and I know that's in the, in the following report after this one, but we have a budget of nearly $79 million for our renewals and compliance program. So I'm just asking the question now, and I appreciate after two months it's, it's a little bit unfair to say I'm not seeing this expenditure starting to creep through. 
But have we got sufficient disciplines on board to make sure that our, um, our renewals program, which is to be funded out of revenue, out of the additional revenue that we've got, is and will be on track and we will clearly see that as the year progresses. Uh, the answer to that is yes, and, and, and that's pr better, better answered by, by Chris when we get to that part of the report, I think. So all capital will be in the capital report, including renewals. Yep. Um, and, um, but I want to see a renewal specifically quite separate from the cap, you know. You will. You will. Yep. OK, OK. I'm not seeing that, though, in the last two months because I would have thought our balancing the books, uh, and I, I appreciate I'm, I'm jumping between, I'm jumping to the next report, but our balancing the books, or our, I don't know, what do we call it now, everyday costs, suggests that we're about 4.2 million over what we had calculated in our budget. Yeah, you'll get more visibility in the capital report in terms of the renewals program, and from a, um, you get a date perspective and renewals uh, spending in terms of our renewals. Um, it won't be linear. It, it will be yeah. Yeah, you've, you've so got a year to date position. It will be therefore. visible for us to see as the year progresses. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Thank you. I guess to explain my comment before, too, just going back to Councillor Angers, um, the 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 key. The key thing we need to do to be agile is to reprioritise a capital programme so that we understand what's most important to deliver but turn off the things that are associated with growth that's not coming. So I uh, just want to make that point. Now, members, just uh, sort of a little bit on the, less the stub substance but the presentation. This is a new report, so... Um, I certainly, as chairman of this committee, but certainly I hope the presenters and writers of the report, are very open to suggestions as to rephrasing things to make things clear. I've got a pages of stuff I want to have rewritten. Um, but I'm very open to anyone's advice or suggestions as to how um, this can be made more succinct and made clearer. Uh, hopefully we can make it a little bit shorter, but that may not be the case. I, I don't want to... Um, cut things out that are important. So by all means, feel happy to send it to Tracy <laughs> or someone. We need someone who can collect um, rewritten paragraphs and things like that. Okay, so very happy for all of these because these th these three reports are all brand new and they they won't be perfect at the moment. Okay. If I can also add to that um, part of our debt to revenue we, through the ten year plan, we um, set ourselves a self imposed debt. To revenue limit of 230, just to, um, also um, put on the table that that doesn't have to be the the new norm. I mean, I think that we should be focusing on repaying debt, of course. So if we were to find you mean that's not a target. It's not a target. That's that's a limit. It's that's not a target. Not a target. Well, you know, the, the days of going back to 200 would be a great day. Okie dokie. What'd you say? <laughs> um, this is kind of that, that rule, that, just looking through my notes, which a lot of them are, un, un, I couldn't repeat them here. Um, page, uh, page 36, paragraph 16, um, I've just written down their disclosed delegations, but I think that is referring, coming back to your, or maybe it was my wording, or your wording, the rule book about this stuff, okay, so I've just said we just need to disclose the delegations there because it doesn't, it just says the things that need to happen but it's kind of difficult. Um, I think when they happen, as I have done on the table, who, who had the delegation to make that decision will be yep. recorded. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it needs, and don't want to get too workshoppy here, but, um, you know, we need to know who makes the delegations. There, there then, then there needs to be a timing when it's reported. It needs to be clearly known, and you get to the sack if you don't report it by such and such a time, and it gets reported up to this level or that level. Yeah. yeah. But, so those are the yeah, So those are the things we need to be discussing. Eh? Okay. Um. Ed, and one, one more comment um, to the chair. More so, comments the better. So um, another another interesting feature of our ten-year plan is that. Um, all, all committees, in terms of reference, um, support those committees being able to approve 
spend for dollars that are up to their budget in the period that that was budgeted for. If there was a situation, for example, in Growth and Infrastructure or the Community Services and Environment Committee that things needed a change, there's an overarching obligation to refer to the financial strategy in terms of has that just breached the debt to revenue um, ratio. So this is a new sort of overlay in terms of how we operate. Um, so to be clear, anything that was an overspend of a significant amount or changing of timing would need to be, um, a decision to go ahead with that would have to be subject to the impact on the financial strategy. And this committee would be able to view that through this quarterly cycle of financial strategy review. Um, again, the terms of reference of this committee wouldn't necessarily allow us to change that. We would have to then agree as a committee and then put that forward to full council to approve. So, That's the process. So that will see a change in the way we write the financial considerations in most reports. Okay. That back because we're yep. not got <clears throat> uh, one year out from um, the elections. We're not about to change the terms of reference of committees, and we don't want to hamper those committees. But as long as we have oversight. Mm and our eyes wide open when um, a committee decides to have a big spend, unbudgeted spend up. So, so in You're your ticking that box through the financial considerations. Yeah. So, so maybe what we saw in the PX report for the, um, the library is the sort of thing you might see in other reports in terms of Great. financial considerations. Okay. So for example, paragraph 10, the key metrics are third bullet point Someone's written setting rates at 9.7 per cent. Rates increases. Yeah, so that's yep. not correct. Is it? Okay, all right. Okay, so is there any more discussion or questions about this report? Okay, so again, I urge members to please um, give Tracy you know, like just help, helpful suggestions how how a paragraph might be rephrased, or if it even needs to be there, or stuff that isn't there that should be there that isn't there because it's, it'll make our job a heck of a lot easier if the report's understandable. Okay, um, all right, uh, I will move that the Finance Committee receives the report. Seconded by Rob Pascoe. All those, oh, sorry, any debate? Uh, I, Tracy has assured me with a nod and a wink that she's got a couple of things that I've brought up on the list, so I don't need to continue with that. But I do want to thank staff and you, Mr Chair, and possibly your deputy as um, chair as well. I know it's really difficult when you design new, um, new financial reports, but my, the only caution that I would have with this one, if we're going to add things onto it, but I don't think that that's what you want, is to keep it high level because it is monitoring our financial strategy. And um, that's really important. We don't want to be buried into the detail and lose sight of those three key pillars that, that you know, that we've really got to keep an eye on. Um, but so thank you. And yeah, I'm sure it'll evolve over the next few meetings, but I thought it was a very good report. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any more debate? All right, uh, I'll move the report be received. Those in favour, please say yay. Those against, please say nay. There are no nays. The report is approved unanimously. Thank you. Next item is page 41, item 14, the annual monitoring report for August 2018. Uh, Mr Chair, to start with, uh, there's uh, some corrections to the report that uh, <coughs> I emailed out this morning. Uh, and further to that, um, page 51, um, note 3. Um, isn't, isn't our best work. Um, um, the column capitalised uh, capitalisation to date, uh, they should all have brackets around them, there's negative signs. Which page are you on? Page 51, no. note 3. Uh, the third column, capitalisation to date, negative all of those numbers signs. should have brackets oh, on, the negative not, signs, not negative right? signs. No. But uh, oh, okay. <laughs> to, to add to that, um, those numbers are all to the nearest thousand, but the totals are uh, uh, to the nearest million. Um, so, yeah, fine, fine Stephen, there fine was a work. Monty Python episode <laughs> where a guy said you've got everything right, except it's the wrong way around. Yeah. You've just entered that, this, this, you've this, entered this, that world. There's elements of this report. So <laughs> our focus on developing uh, new reports um, meant that uh, we missed uh, some basics on, on what is, is an old report. The other, 
while we're looking at note three, it's about work in progress, and work in progress is a discussion that's better had with the capital report. So probably note three uh, will disappear from this report next time anyway and go into the capital report, uh, which is a better place to have a conversation about work in progress. So um, the changes to this report, it's more focused on the 2018-19 operating result. Everyday revenues and costs balancing the books is reported and a focus will go on to forecast results and forecasting changes in the future. Um, that I think we'll end up focusing more on our year-end position than our month-end position as we develop the forecasting. All matters related to the capital report have been transferred to the capital portfolio monitor report. Um, and at this time we decided vested asset revenue was better um, in, in this report because it's a revenue item um, rather than the asset report. Um, we'll see how that works. Uh, the, um, in, in the, probably the big change is the activity reports on page six, and, and can we go to page 62, which is the transport one? Because there's quite a substantial changes to these activity reports um, that have been recrafted to hopefully provide better information. Um, so the, the new report identifies the everyday revenues and everyday expenses as the balancing the books measure does. Uh, the sum of all activities, so, so if we had to add all the activities up, they would add up to the overall whole of council balancing the books result. There's then an adjustment for capital revenue, which obviously isn't included in everyday costs and, re and revenues, uh, and that brings us to the operating result, which is um, uh, when, if you add them all up, they'll add up to the statement of comprehensive revenue and, and expenses. In each of these activities, while we're looking at the transport report, you'll only see the, res the rates that are directly charged or paid for by the activity. The rest of the rates will be in the general activity. That solves one of uh, Sorry, will the you discussions that again? Gary that was had. One of my bullet, that was one of my questions. So say that again. Yeah. So, so the rates will only be the direct rates that are that are paid for by the activity. The, f the full rates are, it will be in the general activity, which is page 66, and you'll see the $170 million worth of rates at the top of that page. So we haven't allocated the, the rates to activities. We will have to allocate the rates to activities in our funding impact statements as part of our annual report because that's a requirement. But for the purpose of these, it's a whole lot more focused on direct costs and, and less allocations, which should make for a much better discussion, a much better variance analysis uh, when we're looking at, at these. Um, in the transport report, back on page 62, uh, you'll see that the adjustment for NZTA, capital subsidy on renewals, is in there. That's an adjustment we make um, to, to separate the... Um, to, to match the revenue with the, the expense, being the depreciation, the renewal expense, uh, and, um, and, and pull the capital part of it out of our everyday revenues. You also see a personnel cost line, which is a line you never saw with the old activity reports. It was buried in a heading called admin costs. And in my opinion, you got some pretty bland explanations that the reason this, this line was, was, was overspent was because of overheads with no, no real understanding. So with the personnel costs um, separated out, um, whereas I think previously the old transport report said there's almost zero personnel costs, this one shows that there's an annual budget of, of $6 million, uh, which should be more meaningful. Uh, internal capital recoveries, you'll see at the bottom of the everyday expenses, that represents largely personnel costs, staff time, that has been capitalised, and so that comes out of the everyday cost calculation. Overheads have been eliminated from all of these reports. So overheads shouldn't be an explanation for a variance in future. Anymore. Again, more, and, and, and of course overheads are a direct cost in the overhead areas, and to, to, to resolve that, we've now got an overhead activity on page 65. And so this is the direct costs 
of the overhead activities, which is the CE's office, the corporate group, the strategy and communications group, and the strategic property group. Uh, and um, we've got some transparency there uh, that will help. Um, And then we'll go to the general activity on page 66. Now I'll just run through this, all the lines on this. So I've got all the rates, as I said. Um, there's an other revenue line uh, with a budget of 4.3 million. And that's one of these um, tricky accounting things. It is the HIF fair value benefit. Um, that, Sorry, um, what was the second? The, the HIF the, and the what? The HIF fair value benefit. Oh, so it's because the same we're thing. getting interest-free money, yep. the accounting rule is we have to recognise that as revenue. And of course, the other side of that is, as time passes, uh, we have to then discount back that revenue, which is the line at the bottom of the everyday expenses, less HIF discounting. At the end of sorry, just at the end this, of the ten-year loan, it all comes to zero. Is this an accounting requirement? It's an accounting requirement. So if someone, so if your dad lends you, <laughs> you know, four hundred million dollars to build in peacocks. Um, you have to assume, yeah, an interest rate. Yes. Oh. Where's where's the value to anyone in that? <laughs> but is is it just a rule? Is it? It's a rule. Well, who said it? Yes. Otherwise it, will end, otherwise, it will end up on that uh, yeah. letter of representation we get from the auditors. That's just stupid. So, because, that because of that, it? it's, 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 it's because of that, it's sitting on this page away from everyone else uh, on, on, its, on its own. And it's only available in this place, yes. Yes. So, can you, you actually see label it. that other revenue then? Because nothing else is going to affect that 4.3 million. So, can you call it what it is so you can remind us? So we don't think, oh, yay, we've just somehow picked up 4.3 million. Yeah. There's something else in there, and I can't remember what the something else is. very small because we actually take the fair value benefit out of the everyday costs calculation, and you'll, you, you'll see that. So there's a... There's a small hundred thousand dollars in there, and I can't remember. I what think it. we're going to move. Can we retitle the move report on. the stupid yeah. government report and on. then call the other report the one that makes yeah. sense or something? So something that does make sense is the DC income is there on is this page. That makes sense. The DC income is on this page, and it's split into two. It's it's the it's the co it's it's the interest cost component, which is in the revenue, and then the capital component is sitting down in the capital revenue. So all the DC costs are, are on this page. Um, looking at the everyday expenses, um, you can see the 257000 for the depreciation forecasting adjustment uh, is, is in there, and, and that's because at this point in time we haven't allocated that to specific projects, and, and therefore it's not we're not able to allocate it to an activity. Um, and the finance cost is more HIF discounting on fair value benefit, which is then removed at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> uh, strange line that I'd rather not talk about this week, but uh, it's in here, so I need to talk about it. Um, and the 526 operating maintenance cost uh, is the budget for the last payment to Waikato for the, for the last boundary change that was made. So it's the final year of payments for that. Oh, yep. Um, and so that doesn't sit uh, comfortably in any other activity. Other costs. <laughs> other other costs. <laughs> other costs um, of uh, minus four million dollars. There, that's um, this year's share of the ten million dollar savings, um, which is going to be th three million dollars of that will be the vacancy factor, um, and, and then the other million dollars uh, we'll have to find somewhere else, and that'll be subject to a report in December. But this year the vacancies won't be in our contract renewal team, will it? Not like it was last year. 
No, that's right, yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna gonna so yeah, which which no, department no has got the vacancy about. thing oh, that right. we will be rectifying oh, that. this year's Thank you, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's that. So that's the changes. Um, what about the financial result, which is the purpose of this report? Um, well we're only two months into the year. Um, and largely everything is close to budget. The accounting result on page 42 shows a surplus of 3.2 million, slightly behind budget. Um, but as you can see on page 32, 42, sorry, can't read my own writing. Um, sorry, where are you getting your... Um, it's on page 42. 42, this one, no? Oh, you're not on page 47. Oh, OK. So the accounting result at the top of the page, um, $0.5 million variance there. But you'll notice uh, at the next box down is the um, accounting result annual forecast. And we're forecasting an improvement at the end of the year of, of $0.9 million. And of course, that's the two forecasting changes that we made, the $570,000 million, uh, $570, extra money for, for rates, the $257,000. Uh, of less depreciation expense and the consequential interest on that comes to 856,000 which rounds to 0.9 million. The everyday costs, the revenues and costs balancing the books figures are, are below that and interestingly there's a 4.2 million dollar um, variance there um, as uh, Councillor Rob pointed out earlier and the big reason to go from a $0.5 million loss to $4.2 million surplus is that the balancing the books calculation removes the vested asset income, um, which is three... Uh, vested asset income... Which... 1.8 uh, million, huh? 1.9. Which is three... Yeah, which is 1.9 million, but 3.1 million behind budget. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and and so when you remove that out, you, you suddenly end up with a surplus oh, okay. because all of our revenues are ahead of budget by a little bit and all of our expenses are under budget by a little bit. Um, and we know with vested assets that they're lumpy, they're not yes. each month, so yeah. there's yeah, no... And, and they're capital, right? So they don't become right. a form of that, yeah. part of that it's calculation. Yeah. And you also see that our revenue, our everyday revenue and costs forecast for the end of the year has got that same 0.9 uh, uh, benefit because those two items we changed are, are everyday revenues and expenses. And so that sums up, I think, Bella, where we're at at the moment. Do you understand this? Because it's, I don't blame for not. <clears throat> just, I, I just. Yeah, I just I, thought that Bella probably has had no exposure to the balance in the book stuff and things like that. She's probably wondering what on earth this is about. I guess on top of what Stephen said, we have to um, point to elect, elected members to um, paragraph 50, which talks about emerging issues. So whilst we're currently forecasting a positive variance year to date, we know there are a couple of topics there that are, are coming our way, so we need to deal with those. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of things myself. Um, page 42, um, paragraph, page 42, where am I? 42. Sorry, paragraph 14. Says the um, balancing the book results is $2 million, a part $0.2 million positive. Yet you go to the, sorry, on page 47, the same thing is reported, and... Uh, Gary? Yeah? Uh, apologies, that, that falls in the same category as where I started this. There's an error on that page. Which page is the error? So page 47, the balancing the books result at the bottom of the page. Um, aside from the... Um, the variance is not calculating in that column that's full of blanks. Yeah. The, um, the, the figure 
part of development contributions, um, 2273 is incorrect and should be 2474, which brings the everyday surplus to 188, which is 0 0.2. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, page 43, paragraph 25, um, says the year-to-date everyday revenue ex exceeds budget by 3.2 million. Where's that disclosed? I couldn't find everyday that anywhere. Everyday revenue exceeds budget by 3.2. It's a typo. It's 4.2. Could be four point two, sure. Year to date, everyday revenue exceeds budget. Oh, everyday revenue. Sorry. Ah, we took a page out. <laughs> no, we deliberately we decided to leave Python. it, but I left. I left the words in. <laughs> Don't mention the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you added up all the everyday revenues on all the activity yeah. statements, you would see that number, but we took that page out because we ended up with a duplication with a statement of comprehensive revenue and expenditure and everyday calculation, giving two answers to the same question. But I didn't, didn't, didn't delete that paragraph. Okay, and this one's just a little more substantive. Page 47, the actual statement of comprehensive revenue and expenditure. Um, the rates figures, um, I know we, are, we have got two different rates at the moment. We've got a, what we're calling our general rate, which is the capital, the amount, the rates that are being collected via capital value rating, and a transitionary rate, which is the stuff that's being collected by on land value. Mm -hmm. But I assume that both of those, those streams of revenue are included in the rates figure. Yes. And if they are... How come we've done, we've received $26 million of rates year to date this year, whereas we collected $37.8 million rates year to date last year? We're about $11 million behind, and yet we've increased our rates by 9.7% across existing rate payers plus there's growth. It usually depends on the timing of when the rates invoices go out and to which part of the city. So that was my next question. Um, so you remember last year? Yeah, yeah, but, so, but that's primitive. No, so surely, surely the logical thing is simply to take our rates, budgeted rates, and divide it by twelve, and then put it in the in the and then alter it for anyone, any rate payer goes bankrupt and we can't get the rates and that sort of stuff, because because so, so otherwise it just massive swings and and they're not real, are they? That's not a real right. def deficiency. You're right, Gary. Yeah. If you remember, we picked up this point last yeah, year. Yeah. But what we did is we booked the full quarters of rates in the first month. And so this is a comparison two months in. Um, we fixed that That's after the, the first quarter right. last quarter. year. So that 37 included the full quarter of rate. So the, the <coughs> last year's year to date is has got a one reports. month of accrued rates as correct. well. Correct, correct. Whereas this is, so that roughly, that 25 is two thirds of 37. Two, two months where the other one counts three. Is that what we're going to do from now? Is that the way we're going to do it? We fixed now? it up. Last, last year, okay. but we're just representing what we showed in the reports this time. So what would year. happen is if I looked at last year's report, I would find that figure there for August. For August. For year-to-date August. Yeah, which included revenue in advance. Which, which included July, uh, yeah. September's September, yeah. Yeah. rates as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Is that the right way for us to do it? The right way for us is how you... Um, <laughs> we had the conversation, and that is we would accrue... But we wouldn't accrue any revenue, we would have... August, August year to date was two months. It two should twelfths. show two twelfths yeah. of yes. our rates revenue. So that's how we're showing it today, and since the after the first quarter of last okay. year, um, this is just uh, comparing what we actually had in our financial reports the same period last okay. year to this year. Okay. So um, right, after, maybe after next maybe month, if, maybe could gone. you just put a note down there to say um, yeah. at various times the this. The Year-to-date comparatives will be not it'll, comparative. There shall, there shall be gone next report because it was only for one quarter. So the next time we do our year-to-date revenue, it'll oh, be we'll after, fix it up by then. It, it will be okay. it will be apples with apples. All right, thank you. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Rob. 
Thanks for that question. I assume Nick, this time next year, we will be showing the corrected figure for those first two months. So we won't have the 37 million and we'll have the 26 or whatever the figure. Hmm. Okay, okay, sounds good. That answers my, the main question I had also. But I had just one other question on note three um, on page 51 on that fixed assets work in progress. And I noticed in the two months the balance has gone up about 10, well, not quite 10 million, for, uh, sorry, 124, is it 124 million? No. Yeah, that, yep, a... 231. Is that a concern that we're slipping again back into that high work in progress? Or We've are got... you confident that those that work at that time is a fair reflection of what still is in work in progress? Yes, yeah, so th they'll talk about it more when they talk about the capital report, but the, um, we, we, we're spending more than we've ever spent, and that's going to mean that we've got more in work in progress. And what's, what's more important is, is, not that we've, is, is that our work in progress is current and not old. Yeah, and, and, and so we've, we've gone from an 80 to $100 million program to a 220 something million dollar program. We're going to have more work in progress. So you're confident there's still good monitoring going on? You get, you're going to see that when you look at the asset report. Yeah, which will include some ageing. Yep, OK, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Angela. Thank you. Just on page 44, and I'm, I'm glad the um, vested assets little thingy reporting there that I requested is still there, but the impact on the budget, now I know it's it's usually not material, but you have taken that column off. Is, was there a reason for that? Was it just because it's not material? On the OPEX budget? Yeah. Um, no, there's no reason for it. It was, was a material. We just thought this was showing a better picture, but happy to put it back on if you'd... Oh, no, maybe it just gets reported in, in the text yeah. if it, if it yeah. is material. I doubt whether it will, will be in I, the future, I think but with, the, with all the HIF projects, maybe it might be. As you we know, once what, $80 million bridge that has... that I would think that would be very material operating expenses on the budget. So that'll come through our capital programme, because that's yeah. not a vested asset. Yeah. Um, Oh, and and yeah, all the OPEX so. is, is in the budget for that okay. already. Um, the vested assets, um, the... Um, going to be a, a lot. Oh, what was it? I was going to say. Uh, as, as that changes, we will um, change our forecasting. And, and as part of telling you about what those forecasting changes, that, that would come through. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, just that concern again that because we just don't have this the room to move um, on page 58 under planning and development activity report every day costs um, the fees and charges so what page we are uh, page 58 fees and charges year to date 2.1 million now we leave correct me if I'm right Spot, but I'm assuming that we, because we leave 33% of our DC revenue uh, in the budget, because we, um, which is uh, interest costs, because we we say we have classified interest costs as um, an in everyday. everyday. Two different, yeah. two different things though. That revenue line is all about um, revenue relating to building consents, limbs, planning, guidance. Okay, so um, DCs are on the general page, so you know we talked on the general page. Yep. So that's where. Yep. Good. <laughs> okay. So that's that's being reported. In general. All right. Um, that's good. Thank you. On page sixty-three, um, under transport activity, we're one hundred and seven favourable for parking infringement notices and traffic yeah. infringement notices. Is the uh, there's the parking infringement notices now because we're fully resourced to um, enforce the free parking strategy, or is it something else? Evelisa? Um, if I can through the chair. Um, so, Councillor, that parking infringement has been what we're seeing from the data as a result of the technology. Um, oh, good. But the task force has also asked for a breakdown of what those infringements are to be reported back through the Access Hamilton task force. Okay. So they ask for that. And are we fully resourced to implement that strategy now? 
Um, resourcing is still, still. Um, okay. an issue for us. Um, it's something that we're working through. So we may see that, um, that surplus of parking revenue increase as we move towards being fully resourced? Um, we're hoping that um, in terms of infringements, those reduce when, as people actually become, I guess, we don't want to become, well, yeah, we want, yeah. We, we don't want to focus on infringements, we want to focus on actually compliance. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool, great, thank you. Thanks, Angela, Leah. Yeah, I was um, basically the same question what Angela's asked. On that page uh, 63, I get it that the off-street parking has increased. What do we mean there by on-street recoveries of costs added infringements? Can anybody tell me what that means? Second, second, second line. line, halfway through it. On-street recoveries of costs added infringements. Um, so I can answer that too. That those are the costs that we get added through the courts. So in terms of the cost recovery of the infringements that we take through to recover through the court process. It's a $30 fee for lodging information, is it? Um, yes. But can't quite figure that. Um, so come June, we've got to make a decision on your two hour free parking. How will we be able to measure what's gone on in the past with what's happening now? Any ideas? Um, in terms of, if you could, you just clarify: Is it are you talking about in relation yeah. to the revenue? Yeah, I, I, I can't see this as apples with apples. Um. Um, so, in terms of, there is a report coming through to the Growth and Infrastructure Committee in terms of more detailed financial um, as a breakdown. So that was reported through the Access um, Hamilton Task Force parking on Monday. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Yeah, so which will provide right. a background this into the previous last years, which has been requested by elected members. Last full year we did a running down system and yeah. the parking first part of the year. Oh, the so running summit was there. And just on that 107,000 uh, infringements, it looks, a, it looks a lot, but really it only amounts to 13 infringement notices per day if there's a warrant or a license label, which is not a hell of a lot, is it? No. Bella. Thank you, Gary. Uh, just a question on, I know there's been a lot of thought between the new way of everyday costs and everyday revenue. Uh, I can see depreciations amongst your everyday costs. Has there been a consideration, uh, ideal objective is to repay debt around a cash perspective too, around everyday costs, everyday revenue, given depreciation and amortisation is non-cash related? We see, we see debt as um, the bucket, if you like, of our ability to afford our capital programme, so our debt to revenue. So we don't, we don't really look at, from a cash perspective, um, cash flow statements or accounting okay. in that way. Um, right. It's not something that we do. Can, can I add that um, we seek to fund our depreciation to... So we link our depreciation to our renewal of our assets mm -hmm. and maintaining our service level, mm -hmm. and we seek to fund that um, from from rates as opposed to funding it from debt. So we use debt for new capital, and, and so the everyday um, <coughs> balancing the books calculation, that was that was a factor in deciding to keep depreciation as a non-cash. It, so, it sort of matches with the revenue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so just to expand on that, Bella, sorry if I may, um, the, th the thinking is that if we're going to replace an asset, so it, if, 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 if the decision of the council is that this asset needs to be replaced when it's not, and it's still adding value to the community, we should be funding its replacement now, and that's what we do, by, which you understand, through, um, through depreciation. Rather than, so we're taking our money from the rate par now and putting it in a, in a little bucket or a jar for the future replacement. Um, the fact that generally these things cost a hundred, you know, twice what we <laughs> thought they were going to cost when we go to replace them is, is a different different issue. But yeah. that's 
the rate, well, that's my thinking of why, because I, I agree, you know, depreciation is, you've already spent the money, and um, yeah, so that is the rationale, I, the way I think of it anyway, which is a probably form one accounting way of looking at it, but. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's the putting the money in the bucket bit that, that I'm most uncomfortable with what you said there, Gary. Pretty much our annual depreciation Debt is the bucket, isn't it? Well, pretty much our annual depreciation expense and our annual renewal expense match. Yep. Does it? Yeah. Oh. Okie dokie. Um, so there are no more questions by the look of it. I'll move the report be received. Do I have a seconder? Mallet, Taylor, any debate? Can, can I just, again, emphasise members to help us improve the way these things are written and things you want to see in there, things you don't, well, things that you don't think have value. So please, um, give every, Tracy, give everyone your <laughs> email address. Um, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I'll move the motion. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, nay. Are there any nays? Thank you. Carried unanimously. Okay, the third, I think this is the last item of the meeting. Do we need to do it? Okay, thank you. So we're now on to item 15, Capital Portfolio Monitoring Report, page 69. Tenakwe Mangai Bella, Co Chris Aho. Kia ora, Co So, um, councillors, um, this is the third in the trifecta of the reports on page 69. So, in the uh, time honoured tradition of Stephen, I've just got a couple of corrections to make. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these were uh, picked up by the chair through discussion and they were good things to pick up and it's just about getting our language right between budgeting and forecast. So if you go to page 28 on page 73. Paragraph so, 28. Uh, paragraph 28. Uh, instead, of being, instead of being forecasted at 79 million 65 million 65, should be budgeted at. I'll just ask democracy to um, record these corrections, please. Uh, 29, same thing. And the forecast for 2018-19, it should be in the budget for 2018-19. And paragraph 34, same thing again. The program is ahead of forecast. It should be ahead of budget. And just the last correction is over the page on page 43. Attachment 4 should read attachment 3. Thank you, General Manager. Can I just ask you to leave us a copy or show those to us before at the end of the item? Sure. Um, so, so this report, uh, there's been a lot of good discussion on some of the content today. Um, it replaces the previous key projects report. Um, hopefully it's a lot more, well it is a lot more comprehensive than uh, the reports that we had and it will be in the fullness of time. Um, hopefully uh, the reports are a lot more meaningful in regard to the projects uh, we are doing in the different areas of the um, city. So I just wanted to respond to a couple of comments that um, were made in the previous discussions and uh, particularly by Councillor O'Leary and uh, Councillor um, Paula in terms of outcomes. So our, absolutely our intent is to try and move to describe, uh, describing programs and work and the outcomes that they're going to deliver for the community. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on that, I know, um, but if you look at paragraph 12, uh, where we've listed the, the eight programs, what we've tried to do there is describe the outcome that each of the programs is trying to achieve. So if you look at the transport improvement one, the outcome we're looking for the community is enabling growth, improving safety and improving transport choice. So over time we hope to have a bit of commentary about how our delivery of project, projects is um, uh, pushing for those outcomes. If you look at the 
Peacock program, you know, the outcome is enabling the development of an attractive and sustainable community in the Peacock growth area. So it's a start, uh, but I think we've picked up on the notion that was discussed and how do we get some commentary around our collective delivery of projects in terms of the outcomes we're delivering for our community. So we would um, certainly welcome some one-on-one -on -one time with some of those councillors to get some feedback and how we could um, further, further that. So just another comment uh, in relation to Councillor O'Leary's comment, which was a really good one, I thought about um, the market and what the market's doing. So in this report, um, we're, we're trying as a capital delivery group to provide a number of insights. So if you look at paragraph 47 of the report, we've got a section on there where we're, over time we want to get some commentary going with you about what's happening in the marketplace. So if you turn over to paragraph 54, which was on topic with the discussion, uh, we know that inflation affects all of our business and the example our councillor used was petrol prices on our operational costs. Um, but the, it all has a big impact on our capital delivery as well in terms of costs that are passed on to us by uh, the supply chain. So we're recognising in there that we do get our data by Bill, um, but there'll be knowledge on the ground that we want to do um, our contractors, our supply chain, and trying to predict what's happening. Um, for us in capital, I guess the manifestation of that is in our tender prices, and are, we, are our tender prices coming in on uh, budget? So we'll know very, very uh, quickly if we've got a problem there, but we want to uh, uh, deliberately use the word insights to try and get ahead of the game with the data we've got in a number of areas. Availability of resource is a big issue um, that, that's going to affect um, New Zealand, um, uh, right across New Zealand in delivering projects. Um, the inflation, um, legislation, and policy changes and seismic changes is one of those um, things that's biting us as council. So we want to be ahead of the game, seeing those coming and get some commentary going in terms of, of risks. Um, last thing is um, absolutely had the ears open listening to that comment about risk. Um, we'll pick up on that. We do a lot of really good risk management down at a project level. How can we sort of bring that through to the portfolio level and, and once again get some commentary going around risk in terms of the capital delivery? Um, so, just as a summary of this report, the, the, one of the um, uh, tasks that we've got is last year we delivered a $102 million program in 17-18. This year it's 254, so it's twice as big as previous years. Um, so that, that's certainly a task that, that in the development group to oversee that. We rely on the whole organisation uh, to work with us to deliver on that. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say I think we're making really good progress and you'll see from uh, the first two months that, that we're, we're meeting our budgets, so we've got a long way to go. Um, but the third month, which is not in this report yet, but once again we, we've met the budgets that um, we said we were going to meet, so we've made a, a really good start to it. Um, the, if you just went, we had some really good highlights, I think, in paragraph 25. So, um, delivering capital projects um, is a, about having a really good production line going. So, you start two to three years ahead of a bulldozer on site where you're, you're planning, uh, you're investigating, you're consulting, you're talking, uh, you're designing, and then you start letting contracts. So, we've have a very good production line going for a lot of our big contracts and you can see in the first three months of this year some of the contracts that we've awarded and the costs of those. You know, $28 million wastewater treatment plant upgrade, Thomas Gordonton Road, um, bulk water pipes in Ruakura, uh, the Peacock Professional Service are all um, awarded. Our renewal projects for waters are all contracted out. In paragraph 26 we've got um, four more big ones. One you just um, you looked at in public excluded today with the uh, Rotatuna Sports Park and Park Lane, um, Wairi Cobham uh, Bridge, which you looked at the other day, Western Wastewater, which is coming to the next meeting, and and the wastewater design. So 
um, a lot of confidence that we've got our production line going and, and we're delivering a lot of work. It's about $100 million of, the, um, of work um, there over a number of years. So I just want to quickly uh, talk to uh, the structure of the report and the attachments in particular. Um, the, these are a, a work in progress and uh, we, we will uh, really appreciate feedback from councillors and what they'd like to see. So at the previous meeting, we explained that we wanted to break the capital program down into programs of work. So whereas previously, uh, we looked at our capital program and what we were delivering on water and wastewater and transport and parks, um, we weren't telling a good picture of what we were doing to build communities and, and deliver projects within geographical communities. So we've broken the whole $254 million program down into those eight programs. So you can see there's some greenfield uh, growth cells of peacocks, uh, Rotatuna, Rotakauri and Ruakura. Um, the citywide is all our work in our treatment plants. Our transport improvements is all the work we're doing around the Access Hamilton um, Task Force. Um, citywide community um, is a lot of work in Lance's uh, group to build a great river city. And probably uh, the most, one of the most important is the blue box, which I'll come to uh, renewals and plants. And so, Councillor Rob, you had some questions on that before, and I'll come to that in a minute. So what we've decided for um, this report is just to put a number of sheets up uh, to you, not all of them. Um, by next uh, meeting, we hope to have all of the eight programmes up, so you can look at each of the eight programmes and see what we're doing and ask lots of questions on each of those eight programmes. Um, there's a lot of work to move to this and we wanted to test it with you today in the committee to show you what we're doing and then have some dialogue, particularly with the Chair and Deputy Chair but any other councillors over the, the next four weeks. So attachment two on page 81, we've attached the traditional um, way that councillors have always seen uh, projects delivered. So. Uh, we want to keep that familiarity going, but over time we want to move you to looking at um, projects, not by activity, but projects. Um, I think the example I used last time, well, we, you, you, you signed off uh, one today in the um, Park Lane and Rotatuna Sports Park. So the project had funding from lots of different activities, but really it's one project for the community. They don't see a Project, a wastewater project, a transport project or a park project, they just see a project that we're doing and that's the shift that we're trying uh, to make. So we, we can just give you information on that combined project and the community will see that developing over the next 12 months, they'll see the park and the road developing at the same time. So the first um, sheet I think is on page 85. And the, the language that we've used is um, portfolio is the total summary of all of our projects. So the $254 million is the portfolio. So this first sheet is a summary of how we're doing against the whole portfolio. Um, so you will see some commentary in the top right hand there about how we're going on projects. The top left is a is a, a traffic signal type report that we're still working on. At a quick glance, you can see whether it's in good shape or not so good shape, and what you're looking at is green. So at this point in time, with two months to go, uh, two months into the program, we're really happy in how we're delivering it. That will change over time as, as different things happen. You're about to drop down to the programs and see where different things are happening um, uh, just with that granularity. What, what we are uh, focusing on this year, which we've never focused on uh, as well before, is capital revenue. So if you look at the two graphs down the bottom, um, um, Stephen told you about the colour frame, the colour we were using, blue, green and grey. Pleased to say I think we've got our colours right, Stephen. <laughs> um, but you can see, you know, for the first two months, we're just right on track for budget. And you can see we're a little bit ahead of our revenue. Um, I think Councillor O'Leary, you asked a question last month about the steepness of the, the graph. So you'll be able to see these graphs now and ask more detailed questions and you'll be able to drill down to the programs and see where that's coming from. 
So you can see a really steep rise from sort of April to May. And there are things uh, that you'll see driving that, like um, for instance, there is a $5 million progress payment that we've got to pay that, of revenue that from NZTA for our resolution drive. So there are reasons for that programming, um, but you'll be able to see those graphs and ask a lot more questions on why things are like that. If I just turn over the page, the portfolio, the portfolio um, sheet had two pages. All the programs will just have um, So you, you can see on page, page 86, um, a summary of all the programs in terms of expenditure and revenue uh, with commentary on the right. And Councillor Rob, down below is our work in progress. So get the questions. Um, Paul Gow is going to answer all of those questions because he knows <laughs> it better than I. But what, what that graph is showing you is we're showing you the age of the WIP as well. So although we've got $107 million of work in process, progress, you can see that the green uh, work in progress, almost you know, $78.8 million is just business as usual and it's not late. Uh, the red is definitely uh, late and the green, uh, the yellow is starting to get late. So that's the area that we've got to focus on in our um, uh, processes to, to deal with that. And I can assure you that we're, we're right onto that. This is a lot better than we've previously seen. Um, I don't think you've probably seen it in Age of Whip before, just to understand what uh, my, my language, good whip or bad whip. <laughs> so you're seeing the bad whip here and that's what we're focusing on. So almost finished. So if we just then turn over the first program report. Um, so this, we've chosen Rotatina because there is so much going on in Rotatina, so many projects. Um, so central to it is a, a, a map there with all of our projects in. Um, we've put some dollar costs there. Now some of those dollar costs uh, just need a bit of alignment. Looking at it today, I think it would benefit from some dates in there as well when we're going to do those projects because some of those projects like Borman Road um, extension uh, to the east at some time away, so we just need to put the dates in there, I think. So once again, you can see the um, expenditure and revenue graph. The revenue graph, that's that $5 million um, for the resolution drive payment that I talked to, and if you look at the comment under revenue at the top, you can see the explanation for that. So we're, we're trying to, we'll be trying to anticipate your questions on things that you see in the graphs and trying to put some commentary on those um, to let you see. So the very last one before I um, just leave it open to questions is probably the, um, one of the most important uh, programs for us and Council did uh, make a, some concerted decisions um, in this LTP to reinvest in our asset. And so if you look at that one in the pie graphs in particular down at the bottom right, <coughs> you can see that for 17-18, we invested um, $46 million in this program. This year we're investing $78 million. So we've had quite an um, increase in expenditure in looking after our um, assets. Um, you can see uh, some patterns there too. If you look at the green one, you can see the proportionate split on community is quite a bit higher this time than last time. And I reflect, I think that reflects years of probably underinvestment in our community assets and a bit of reinvestment uh, back into that. Remember, the pie is bigger, but the split for community is quite a bit bigger as well. So, Councillor Rob, the, we, we've put uh, renewals and compliance together. So, renewals, you understand. Compliance is our minor capital program that's not really renewal. A, um, a minor level of service uh, budgets that we need across our business to do capital works and we've put them together because they're generally delivered by our asset managers. It might be that we need to separate out the renewals for you in that so we can just you can just keep a track on the renewals but if you're okay we might come and talk to you about that and you'll comment about that one. But if you look at that one you can see our progress. Uh, yes. Something that might yep. pop up from time to yep. time. So some of our funded um, seismic work will be in here, yep. um, particularly on the trek plants. We're doing some work out there. Um, we, we have minor 
minor project budgets out of the treatment plant, which is not renewal, but things going wrong all the time that we need to fix, and it's capital. So they're, they're the low cost things, but they are, are really operational in nature rather than a big project that we're delivering. Thank you. So in terms of that program, you can see uh, that we're on budget for spending the money. It's a fairly linear program, you could see, which you expect in renewals. It's not really uh, normally weather dependent. Um, it's per monthly. So the first two months, we're tracking really well on expenditure. And uh, we're ahead on revenue, and that's probably relating to um, NZTA subsidy. So once again, um, just a lot more information. And the important one is the three-year program. As we get into this, we want to be able to come to you when <coughs> things pop up which are unexpected. Um, we would hope to come to you and just manage within this portfolio funding. Uh, the, you know, for year, you know, year one, 79 million, year two, 65, year three, 65, and just move the timing around of things so we can manage it. So we're not coming to you and saying, we've just, you know, found another chiller we need to um, uh, re refurbish um, because, you know, asset management things do happen and it's quite dynamic. So we want to be able to come to you and just say we're still going to stick to the same budgets. We're just moving the timing of things around. So that's how we hope to manage that. So we're not coming to you and asking for another four hundred thousand dollars for a new chiller. We're coming to you and saying it's a timing issue. Can you and back we need to bring the this one forward and and we'll defer this. So that's how we, uh, uh, we're I've looking to I've learned a lot about it. chillers today. <laughs> I wasn't just here chill for out, it, mate, so. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so unless Natalie had anything to say, I'll just, I'll just uh, leave it there to answer any questions. Yep. <clears throat> I've just got a few, um, if you don't mind. Uh, page 70. Um, Presumably, this is just sort of mechanics thing. This is a three-year pro. It, it's a three. It's a. It's the breakdown of our ten-year plan into a three-year subsets, if you like. And presumably, when you've completed year one, the, the the portfolio then encompasses those things that are were in year two to year four. Is that right? We just roll it forward like that kind of. Is it that mechanical? Is it that? Um, Natalie said yes. I was going to say we're still to decide that, but um, I think that's probably right. Mm. Just a so, what, what, are, what are the arguments for and against it? Well, I think um, the three-year program static uh, relates to our ten-year plan in the three-year yep. window. The arguments for is a lot of our projects are multi-year projects, and generally they're less than three years. We have a few that are greater than three years, but generally between one and three years. So. If we have a rolling three-year program, most of the time you'll be able to have a, a full project view of a project. So uh, if okay. it went into the fourth year and you weren't monitoring the fourth year, you wouldn't be able to see the fourth year. So, so I think that Natalie is right. We just need to develop that thinking. Mm. So the, the the portfolio concept is that you have vi visibility for three years out. And of course you have visibility for a million years. You know, Andrew wants to build the city for 100 years, um, but you, you have visibility for three years out, and that's, which means, I, I assume, you think, okay, we've got a whole lot of pipe work in the next three years instead of a whole lot of pipe work in the next year. Is that the sort of thing, for a layman to understand what this does, is that the sort of thing you do? Is that, this, is that how you change your decision making, which therefore improves efficiencies, which therefore saves us money and gives us better things, things delivered on time, and is that how it works? There's a n number of answers to that question, but um, for, for the renewals and compliance, that's exactly how it would work. You know, because the renewals and compliance, the way I see it is you've given us a lot of money yeah. to spend on our existing assets and you want us to look after our assets. So we make uh, guesses all the time in asset management about um, when things are going to uh, fail or not fail, um, estimates. Yeah. So it's the nature of the business. <laughs> when we're forecasting, <laughs> forecasting um, using guessing and estimating um, of when, <laughs> when assets are going to fail. But we, we go in and basically um, just don't, uh, on the birthday, go and renew those assets. We'll look at the condition and we might decide we can get another year out of that. So it's quite dynamic over a three-year period. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a really good uh, cohort of um, asset managers together now in that group. We are expecting them to sit around the table and be making trade-offs and decisions about 
priorities and how we best spend that to look after all the assets uh, without leaving any asset group behind. So I think that would be really important that we don't end up spending all of the $65 million on uh, my water pipes, or previous water pipes, that we, we got to equitably um, spread it across uh, the pie chart, which okay. you see there. So in paragraph, on page 71, at paragraph 16, bullet point, point three, there's a, and I just asked, can you please contrast programs and projects versus disaggregated financial performance information by activity? Is yeah, that so what you is, just so, talked about? Yeah, is that so, the so the example I gave was um, the, um, let, let's take the um, Borman Road. When we, when we. Which one? Um, in, anyone, it's just a, a typical example. So. When we go and uh, extend Borman Road, we take funding out of transport and we take funding out of water because we've got to put water pipes under it and we get um, uh, funding for wastewater uh, pipes um, and, you know, you get parks or you might have stormwater. So, so what this is saying is we want you to hold us to account. Like today you signed off, um, you know, a contract for um, park Park Lane and uh, the Road to Turner Sports Park for a particular uh, dollar figure across a number of funding yes. activities. We want you to okay. hold us to account to that project and delivering that project and not disaggregate it in, into all its various components. Good, you never know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's kind of like there's a really pretty concept out there and I just can't quite get my head. Let me, let me try it, if you don't mind, Chris. Let me have a go. Um, Only if you improve what I see. Um, well, it's got to be, be better I than... I don't want to be as good as what you see. Well, it would, be, it would be hard to be worse than disaggregated financial performance information by activity. It came from <laughs> Which, the department. But no, but I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I understand yeah. what you mean. So yeah. I guess if you have a look at page 82, what you've got is the old capital report, which an activity in um, council terms is um, like arts and community, right? Yep. So you've got different projects under groups of those activities. But what, they, what it doesn't tell you about... So you have pipes to a building, you have a road to a building, which are automatically a different trade, so to speak. Yeah. So these are and all... And you've got dis and sparkies. Disparate projects, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and you, can't really get a, you, you can't really get a full picture. Okay. So the whole... Port, um, the terminology that Natalie and Chris are bringing is that the portfolio is our total overall capital programme for this year. And then that capital programme can be separated into different programmes. And Rototuna, for example, a program of work. Yep, yep. So we start to talk about an area within the city that we are developing through our capital program, that is Rotatuna, and then we have a look at each project within Rotatuna. So in other words, rather than going at a meaningless, um, from a capital program perspective, a whole bunch of projects around activities like arts and, arts and culture or just transport, you actually start to get a bit of a true picture about the growth cells or the city areas that we are developing and all the projects within that. So it might be roads, transport, wastewater, uh, stormwater, all yep. within Rotatuna. You get to see what the level of investment we are putting in as a city each year in Rotatuna and, and parks, and, okay. and we can actually... But, but the, the thing that I like, to, I, I'm after, is an understanding of how this improves our efficiency, um, our, improves our delivery, um, keeps us within budget or maybe saves us some money, those sort of... And, and maybe it's not... This is not the right place to talk about... Yeah, well, it's, it's, no, I've no. asked this a few times and it's you taken know, a lot of time. I, I, I think it is. Look at the project that you signed off today. So it's one contract for building a road and building the park, no, you know, okay. rather than um, uh, Lance leading a contract for the park and us then building a contract for the road. So looking at the the program approach, it allows us to join all of those things up and look for efficiency in how we deliver things. So Presumably you would have tried to do, do those things in the old days, but this just makes it more easy and more obvious that you should do that, is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, Angela. Uh, page 74. I'll try and be clear with my question here. Um, just under capital revenue, and I'm just concerned w that we're treating the definitions correctly. Um, under 35, we say 
Capital revenue includes any capital contributions to projects, including NZTA subsidy. Um, uh, and, and grant money to support blah, 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 blah. But normally when we're talking about capital revenue, I think, we, it feels like the, we're treating, cap, we're talking about the definition of capital revenue now includes transport subsidy when we don't, we call capital revenue under everyday costs doesn't include transport subsidy. See, I'm really confused, so it's quite yep. hard for me to... So there's two... There's two Explain NZ, what NZTA asking. give us two lumps of money, yep. two types of revenue. One is for the capital program to build a road, and one is money to maintain the road that we built. So the money that they give us around um, maintenance yep. of roads goes in our everyday costs because it's, it's everyday maintaining... Revenue. Yes, yeah, everyday revenue. Yes, yeah. Everyday revenue, everyday costs. Yep. But the, the revenue you're talking about here is... Uh, money like the 51% FAR uh, yeah. contribution that comes through from NZTA to build a new road. Yep, but kind of under both definitions, we're just calling it capital revenue. You know, mm. an everyday person on the street is never going to work out what on earth this financial jargon means. We've got everyday costs, <laughs> everyday revenue, Every everyday people. Everyday <laughs> people on the street. So, I d you know, yeah. perhaps talk to the, yeah. the director yeah. of... Department of Fantasy Words to uh, come up with just a yep. clearer yep. explanation. Yep. Well, a clearer well, explanation. Um, yeah, me and yeah. Stephen had some discussions on that, but clearly we can do it. We can do a little bit better there. Yep. Yeah. So um, and and that just that's a really good point, Angela. I mean, I, I discussed with Stephen about we're, we're sort of morphing from us yeah. calling it balancing the books to, to everyday revenues and everyday costs. Yeah. And I don't know if the old the the goal is that we stop drip, drop uh, stop using balancing the books and go to that other one. But mm. we are, I think, or was it you I was talking to about it? Um, one I'm of not, you guys. I'm not sure, but we, we don't want to go away from balancing the books. We just yeah. to define yeah. what that means. Uh, yeah. I, and we're, we're, we're kind of tagging it with everyday cost, everyday revenue, so everyone remembers what we did. But yeah. soon we'll drop that and we'll just get into balancing the books. Well, that's really good because that's, I think, would definitely be my strong advice. We are, we are now into a new financial strategy yep. and a new yep. balancing the books. Yep. And you would note, isn't we'll it great that we only had two of them in the report yeah. instead of three? Every day, every day, every day. Just, just to reflect, yeah. Councillor, why it's important us to have in this in here, because it's the project <coughs> managers that are delivering capital projects which are closer to NZTA yeah. and applying for the funding. Yeah. Um, so uh, previously, uh, there'd be assumption of revenue there, and you might get to the end of the year and go, oh, we didn't get the revenue. So mm. I'm hamming it up a little bit, but what we're trying to do is drive accountability into the project managers to know it's really important that they get their revenue on time and be knocking on the door and driving it and asking for it. That's why we've brought the revenue into here, because it's, yeah. it's the project manager closest to the ground in terms of getting the revenue. Yeah, mm. no, m makes sense, makes sense. Um, just on page 87, and I, look, I think that that's um, it's a really good, uh, it's a really good um, uh, combination of the inform high, high enough level of information and low enough level of detail to keep an eye on what's going on with each of those um, capital programs. I just had a, a question, so this is an example, but I'm assuming the facts on here are actually accurate. I thought Rotatuna Town Centre was 18 million, and in here it's 25. We reduced it to 18. So this isn't just an example. This is an example slash, but the, the facts. Yeah, we need to keep that. yeah. and also Sports um, Park and Park Lane. I thought that was six million. Um, I, I think I, I saw that one, but um, okay. remember the reporter had another two million in year two to do the changing room. Yeah, so it's probably the whole lot. Added and together. and because mm. this is three, year, this is a three-year three picture. Year project, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that's, yep, that's all my questions. Thank you. Bella. Thank you, Gary. Uh, tēnā kōrua. Uh, just a question on paragraph 43. Uh, you've mentioned there that there's been no capitalisation on the water assets um, due to uh, t undertaking a revaluation. It's now October, is it? Has yep. it taken three months, is it? Can I just ask Paul yeah. to answer that one? My, my understanding is capitalisation just stops in the valuation? Or yes, anything? that's correct. So um, we have, obviously because we're revaluing the system, so we have to put the system on hold. 
Um, unfortunately, when we went to press the button... Sorry, um, Tracy, do you mean the water system? Um, no, the a fixed asset system. Oh. <laughs> the fixed asset system that holds the water system. Um, when we went to press the button uh, last week to put the revaluation um, through, the system wouldn't take it because um, the, the uh, volume of data was um, enormous. So we're just having a few technical um, issues with it at the moment. Um, so we've um, put it on hold and we're, we're working with the IT team to try and get it through um, this month. So unfortunately that now is another month because once it's obviously a huge volume of data I have to push through, um, we obviously have to reconcile it, get all that sorted. Once we've done that, then I can start um, then putting into the fixed asset register. So. It's, yeah, all of that's now delayed even more, unfortunately. It, um, but we are working on it. So, is that uh, an exercise that you have to go through every time you revalue assets? No, this is the first time we've done waters in five years, I think. Um, so, and it's a different system that we've never mm -hmm. um, put those assets in before. So, a combination of both. But, um, like I say, we're talking thousands and thousands of lines um, of data going through. So, um, we're um, just looking at trying to do it in batches and things like that. So, um, in the test system, we thought it had worked, and um, yeah, but just it, what it does, it hangs and just drops out. Um, okay. We've got the IT guys kind of looking at that. So, okay. yeah. Thanks. That you done, Bella? Okay. Sorry, I've just been well, for the last 20 minutes. I've had this little thing in front of me that we need to move a time extension. Um, we're having so much fun. Yes. So I'll move that we extend the time <laughs> to what we're what we're due. The, we're down. I was down. To, well, I thought we we're going till five o'clock anyway. So. Um, all you're effectively doing is agreeing to have gone over the six hours that was... Uh, we're not putting a time... You don't have to put a okay. time. All right, so I'll move. I'll move. Can someone second it? Okay, James, those in favour, those against, carried. Anyone against? Thank you. Um, now, just... I've got a couple more. Uh, <laughs> page 74. Does anyone want to withdraw their vote on the last... <laughs> Page 74, paragraph 36, uh, and it, these, these are small figures. Uh, the actuals of uh, capital revenue are 1 1.2, 1 1.2 for the first two months uh, versus budget. So they're, they're probably double the budget. Why do we get revenue ahead of our budget? H how, do you uh, how do you apply for capital revenue? So some of it could be dependent on how we spent and it could be just that we had phased our budgets incorrectly. Okay. What we're signalling through the, about the capital revenue going forth, though, is that we have a number of risks about capital, so we're not yet celebrating the fact that we're ahead with revenue. We've got too much in the back end that we need to look out for before we start to say... So, so I was hoping you were going to say, because we've done more work and mm -hmm. qualified for more income, and I don't even... Uh, that, will be, that will be it. Well, say that, that, that way I'll at least yeah. be happy okay. for the first two months of the <laughs> <There you> year. <go. laughs> I think uh, some of it might come from footpath renewals where yeah. we're getting a NZTA subsidy which we hadn't expected. Um, okay. but it's, you know, so there's all various reasons, but um, Natalie's quite right. We've, there are some big risks in our program and um, we'll, we'll be talking to you about those risks as we move forward, particularly in uh, securing NZTA subsidy. Okay. Um, I can't find it, but somewhere you break down your work in, our work in progress... It's paragraph 39. Paragraph 39. I uh, know there's a little fold out thing that's got it on there. It's on page. Oh, here it is, yep. Um, so, so, current work in progress is literally work in progress. So, it's assets that are not finished. In reality, not, not relating to having collected all the invoices up, still being worked on, and you couldn't deliver, you couldn't. Capitalise it because it doesn't work yet. It's still being worked it's still, on. Yeah, okay, that's correct. Okay, yeah. um, assets in use and being processed. So are they the ones that are the assets being used now? But we haven't collected all the information. We haven't got the warranties signed off or what? I'm not even sure what I'm talking about here. But yeah. these are the sort of things that we're talking about, is it? Right. Um, yep. Paul will correct me if I'm right, but the, we've, we've opened up the road and people are driving on it. But we've got 90 days as our policy before it goes red to get all of our as-built and warranties and, and 
do what they do and put it into the system. So uh, those are the yellow ones. Um, if we if we don't meet the 90 days, it goes. They into slip red. into red. It goes into. Okay, red. so the only difference between um, yellow and red is time. Is time. It's not days. a change in the condition of the assets or a change yep. in the the paperwork having been completed. So 15 and 13 are the same, except differentiated by the t how long they have been overdue, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Um, th this has been happening for uh, ages. What are we? How are we getting making it better? Yeah. So th this is this is a lot better. Is it uh, than you, you saw it previously? So okay. If you look at that, it's the 13 million that we want to uh, focus on. So the numbers were a lot bigger a year or two ago. So this is down, and we've got processes in place to manage that. Okay. Just again, I'm, you know, uh, the old man was a builder, you know, and, and he, they did big projects, but I guarantee you they weren't this far. You know, they, they got their bills into the client, they got their certificates and all that, you know, all that sort of stuff. So Why? if I may, um, Chair, the $9 million of it is that city water um, revaluation that I just um, spoke about. So the, there's a reason why I'm here is I can't put it into the system. Okay. Um, so $9 million of that 13 is purely um, all of the water's um, work. Okay. So that'll drop out when... Okay. Okay, because... Okay. Obviously, uh, I don't even want to ask this question, but you, you don't let an asset go into use until you know it's safe. So obviously there are certain certificates have been approved and um, I know for a building it's a certificate of public use or something like that, but I don't know what it is for a road or a water system. So we don't start using things before they're safe. Oh, you're just going to say, no, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's on record now, isn't it? <laughs> yep, uh, for, for transport, we um, big projects, we have a safety auditing process um, all the way through and um, before they come into use we hand over processes to our operational groups okay so, um, in, in general they don't okay the implication of these things is um, presumably uh, what am I saying the implication is an accounting type implication it's just a paperwork implica implication it's not a lower level of service to our community than they or lower level of safety to our community that they sh that they're missing out on is that right correct yeah yeah okay all right thank you um, th this this big report was quite good except um, can, can we next time get headings on each page that might be impossible to do I don't know or hard to do but it's like, so I'm talking page 82. 82's got the headings on it. Then the next page is 83, 84. Yep. Don't have headings yep. on them. It'll be on tent to uh, work with the chair and deputy chair for the, before the full suite comes up. So we'll have another session on it. OK. But we'll do that, yep. OK. Thank you. Um, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, I've got eight. Sit down. Down, boy, down, down, down. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. No, you got eight, haven't you? You got eight. You got eight. You got eight. You got eight. Yeah. I'm just thinking of your questions during the airport presentation. All right. Okay. I will. Are there any further um, questions or debate? All right. I will move the report. Sit down. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> I'll move the report be received. Uh, have a seconder, Martin Gallagher, Mallet Gallagher. Those in favour, those against, carried. Is there any against? Okay, carried unanimously. Thank you.